Recording in progress.
everyone. Today is May 17th, 2023. This is the morning session of the Portland City Council. Good morning, Keelan. Please call the roll. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Wheeler. Here. We'll hear from legal counsel. Where is legal counsel? We've lost our legal counsel. Has anybody taken any legal classes? I've taken a few. Anybody else? Keelan, can you go ahead and read the rules of order and decorum? Do you have them handy? Has anyone taken legal classes? Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, why don't we do this, Keelan? Let's go ahead and do communications. Um, Megan, can you find out if we can get legal counsel here? We'll obviously need them for, for the ordinances. Uh, why don't we go ahead and start with communications, please? First individual, item 376. Request of Erica Gustafson to address counsel regarding charter resolution consideration. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Erica Gustafson. I am here today to ask City Council to consider adopting a resolution regarding our new city charter. I, like many other Portlanders, welcome a change to our current form of government, but feel an important piece was left out of the original, left out of the charter in its newest form. While I applaud the idea of making elections more fair and accessible to all classes of Portlanders to run for City Council, the thought of those who created these rules having a chance to exploit that in-depth knowledge to their own benefit would be appalling. I am asking you today to adopt a resolution that states no member of any of the various charter commissions be able to run for city council for at least two to four years of the full implementation. As we are reading updates and watching the various new charter commissions do their work, it is becoming extremely apparent that this was a massive undertaking and those in charge of overseeing the transition are already finding flaws with regards to what we voted on versus pieces of the existing city charter that are not in alignment. Listening to public comments in these commission meetings, it is very obvious that the larger voting population has no idea what we actually just voted on when you get down to the details. And that's why it would be a huge benefit to anyone serving on either the original charter commission or any of these newer commissions to run for an open seat. They understand the nuances, intent, and any potential loopholes or ways to run that will give them a leg up on their competitors, which is not what the voters were looking for in trying to create a more equitable system of government representation. Temporarily holding them off from running gives everybody a chance to level set and figure out just how this new form of government is going to work for the people of Portland. We already know this form of voting has the potential to create incumbency based on the low threshold to be voted on, to be voted into office. As being in office gives instant name recognition, which often makes it harder to win a seat over the incumbent. 
in allowing members of any of the charter commissions to run for office right away, you're giving them a perpetual head start. Whereas the voters wanted to break down the barriers of participation and tear apart insider politics that favor the few rather than the many. Rather than allow one more head start or insider leg up to just a small group of people, one way to level the playing field is to have a two to four year provision that says if you've already been in charge of making the rules, you do not get a head start in the first phase of implementation of this new form of electing people. Does it sound fair to you that those who created the rules should now be able to benefit from them? Please consider the true spirit of what voters were looking for to have enacted and enshrined in our city code this request to keep our future city council elections truly fair and equitable for all who attempt to run for office. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Erica. I want to thank you for coming and testifying today. I understand your concerns. Um, I also want to um, at least express my understanding of how the rules work here. Um, I think in order to limit who could run for, um, in order to implement your request, I think we'd have to send a proposal, we'd have to change the charter. Um, I'm looking around to folks who might know what's going on. And I don't think that we have an election, which means we'd have to send it to the voters and I don't think that we can, mm -hmm. there are enough elections left between today and the new form of government coming in to actually implement what you have. Uh, but there are smarter people in the room who might have a, a more nuanced understanding of uh, what's going on. Uh, but I think that's how the process works. Uh, and again, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Commissioner Maps. Uh, Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, there was a meeting that took place shortly after they made their recommendations and, and when they were starting to go to the public to roll it out. And I did ask the question that you're bringing up, and the legal counsel had some replies. So we could find that session and allow you to listen to what legal uh, how they responded to my question that was basically similar, which is, is there a conflict of interest when you're designing this mm -hmm. to then not be allowed to um, be in office? And I kind of thought back to my um, times when I've been on boards and such and, and running nonprofits and how um, if a board member, for example, wanted to be the finalist or be the next executive director, that they wouldn't participate on a search committee. Mm -hmm. So I kind of did that parallel. I recall that there wasn't any concerns, but I, I just wanted to let you know that this is in the public record, this dialogue and legal counsel gave some feedback to it. And our office could maybe, uh, hi staff who's out there. Um, Darian Jones will wave his hand, there's Darian. And maybe we could help you find uh, that, the public record of that dialogue, which might be helpful. Okay. But thank you so much. I'm sorry, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thanks so much for testifying, Erica. Um, I, you know, I have some pretty deep concerns that the folks that will be voted running in two years for these seats are going to be largely made up of folks who are on the Charter Commission. Uh, I'm concerned that it's going to breed a level of extremism mm -hmm. that uh, voters have consistently rejected in city commissioner races in the last couple of cycles, uh, that that's what we're looking at in two years. Um, I'm not sure how many people on up here will choose to run for re-election under the new form of government. Uh, and uh, for all those reasons, I have legitimate concerns uh, about what's coming. Notwithstanding, I'm not sure what the solution is at this point. And so uh, I share the concerns about conflicts. I share the concerns about designing a process and then exploiting it for your own political career. And I'm concerned that while voters have consistently rejected extremism, uh, in recent elections in the city of Portland, that is exactly what we're looking to get uh, come November of 2024. So uh, hoping for some solutions in that regard. I, I can't help but to jump on this landmine myself. Uh, thank you. By the way, this, this is, I think, the first time that somebody's come in to talk to the council about this, uh, but it's certainly not the first time it's been raised. There's been a lot of questioning and speculation about, uh, as Commissioner Ryan said, is, is there a conflict of interest here and are there steps that we should take to uh, abate some of that potential conflict? Here's, here's what I think the solution is, given what we know. If somebody, it, there, there are probably constitutional reasons why we could not exclude somebody for participating in the 
uh, reform of government generally, even if they choose to run individually and specifically. So, I mean, that's a, that's a whole can of worms in and of itself. The question for my from my perspective is transparency. Mm -hmm. And if there are people who are shaping the new form of government mm -hmm. who already know that they are going to run for office and have not disclosed that as they have made decisions about how our government should be organized, that will become a campaign issue for them. And so in a sense, I believe there will be a public vetting of some of this uh, some of this potential conflict, or at least they will have to give good explanation. And, and from what I understand based on the rules, based on how, uh, keep in mind, this isn't the city council that created this. This was created by the voters yes. under their own charter. It's the public saying how they want to be governed and then directing us to implement that government, which we're in the process of doing. Yeah, from what I understand, though, it's, it was very, very unclear to the voters they were just desperate. And I do want to say something for the record. That's complicated. Can't, it's complicated. And Candace Avalos, who 9% of the vote for um, Ms. Rubio's seat, has stated publicly that she feels she would have won under this, this new charter that she designed. She feels she would have won with that 9%. She would have got the leftover votes of the top 25%. The single transferable vote system is not fair and it's not understood widely. That's something, that's another topic. But um, someone who designed it, who is writing op-eds for the Oregonian for a whole year, building a name, building a following, who feels they would have won under what they designed feels extremely unfair to me. And I just wanted to state that for the record. D duly noted, and, and just to, to further throw gasoline on this bonfire, um, keep in mind that, that it's not uncommon in American politics, in our political system, for incumbents to have undue influence. Think, think about, for example, the uh, reshaping legislative districts, for example. Um, and Unless they cannot reach an agreement, that is actually done by incumbent legislators. And I have always just assumed, because I'm, I'm not that naive, I always assume behind closed doors there's a lot of horse trading going on. Yeah, I mean, y you can only look at, at the re-election rate of people in Congress and you, you can't fail to come to the conclusion that the districts seem to favor certain people and those districts are drawn by the people who currently are in place. And so I, I agree with you. Um, you know, it, it sort of gets you know, back to um, the Churchill comment, you know, it's, a, it's the worst form of government except for everything else. Yeah. Okay. But, but your, your comment is duly noted. It's a public record. I don't think you're the only one who, who shares it, and I think it will become an issue in some cases. That's my prediction. Okay. I really appreciate your being here. Okay, thank yeah, you. Good discussion, thank you. Next individual, please. Item, uh, let's say th three, three, se 377, I'm sorry. Request of Sherry Dolan to address council regarding Safe Rest Village. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here again. Um, we uh, obviously have moved forward, um, but since I've been to see you, I have been to all of the sites that have been opened and the ones that aren't, including the one that's being litigated. Um, I've talked to Jake Dornblasser, who um, works with the Transition Committee, and um, we have a couple of issues that are still pending. Number one, the placement of the kitchen and the toilets are right next to a neighbor's house, whose house was left off of the original map that everyone was given. The house was just an empty lot. It's not an empty lot. The house has been there for 40 years. Just like the house that was next door to it, that the city owned, because the city owned it so they would have enough property to put a water tower on it. And then in early 2000s, they tore it down because it was condemned. But there's a lot of that in, the lady that lived in it's father worked for the Water Bureau. The person that tore it down was retired Water Bureau. So it was kind of incestuous. Um, but it was torn down because it was condemned because she was using it for a meth lab. So we lived through 
the whole process of that, and now the people that live directly next to it, that share a fence with it, are living next to a toilet and a kitchen. When we all know that had you dug the trenches, the sewer's right there, the water's right there, we all know that, the house was right there. But had you dug a trench 10 or 100 feet back, it would have been on that extra lot that the city originally had bought the property for and not next to the neighbor's house. The other one, thank you for announcing that um, Urban Alchemy is going to be the service provider there. Um, the little research that I've done on them, it seems like it could be a great fit or it could go down the drain. We'll see. Um, the other one is, this is the only facility that has property that shares property in such an intimate way with the neighbors. The one at, at Multnomah Village, yeah, there's an elevation change there. The other ones don't share any, I mean, even the one at Menlo Park, the lady that I talked to that had lived there for 30 years, it's across the street from her. And it's, it's totally different. Anyway, um, we're worried about the satellite camping and the criminal activity continuing. So we would appreciate it if somebody would make the, commitment to us that there would be a thousand foot instead of a hundred and fifty foot. We know a thousand foot can be done. The city of Vancouver does um, expect a thousand foot camping ban next to their safe rest villages. I went to their symposium um, and learned a little bit more about the San Diego program that theirs is based on and I'm hoping that you can take some of that too. And um, on a lighter note, if anybody knows somebody that wants to rent a seven bedroom, four and a half bath across the street from a safe rest village, let me know. Ours is vacant as of June 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? Commissioner? Yeah. Uh, thanks for returning. Um, Sherry, it's good to see you. I know you've been in community, we've been sending you all the communications, so we've done that. I am excited personally that tomorrow the, um, there'll be an opening. The site um, obviously is, is ready to welcome um, folks with Urban Alchemy as a provider. Um, I go there at least once a week. I think I'll just say it looks a lot better than it has in years. And um, I appreciate all of your comments about that it is closer. We, um, each one is complicated. And um, I hope that you will continue to um, stay engaged. And I hope, and I obviously have to have a lot of hope when you're serving the city at this time and you keep doing the work methodically to improve conditions. And I hope like many of the residents nearby, the other uh, villages, that you will see that um, we actually live up to our promise and conditions are better after they're open and operating than they were before. I realize you've been through a lot. I mean, when you explain things that go back decades, I, it's, it's good to hear those stories. Anyway, I, I see we hear you, and I know that um, the Safe Rest Village team continues to keep you in the communication loop. Yeah, I just don't think you really realize what it was. Um, my daughter was married in the field. My granddaughter was born in the house. My daughter had a preschool for seven years there where they got to do bear hunts in that field all the time. After we started finding needles and the, it was, she was unable to continue with a preschool because of the safety issues. So no, I don't really think you all understand um, what a big impact. And right now my neighbor is out of um, internet because PG uh, last Friday, cut a line so they have no Century 21, so they have no internet, no phone. So no, I don't think you guys understand the depths that these decisions that you make, and those decisions that you make, you know, most of us remember that you, your tenure here isn't as long as our tenures as citizens. So all those people that we talk to, cats and everyone, you know, in St. John's, you're all different, 
but we're the same. And I want you to let you know that PGE and CenturyLink are on it, and that the Safe Rest Village team is in communication with them. Okay. Yeah. I, that, and Jake Dornblasser um, has really good people skills. It was, he was very kind and listened to us. Um, one of the things he said, though, was that he, that normally you don't talk to neighbors before you decide where to put things, and as I heard, you guys have talked to everybody, but. Jake said that when it came to placing the kitchen and the toilets, we wouldn't have been considered. That's kind of worrisome. Well, we keep um, editing and, and cleaning up the mistakes. So, you know, it's new, it's we're building, and uh, yeah, when the, you look there's a buffer zone um, impact reduction team is working on the map. And so we'll continue to be in communication with you. Yeah, when you look at that south um, east site, it looks like a pretty wide open area. So consider that when you're putting in the kitchens and toilets there and try to keep them away from the houses because yeah. there are a few there. More in communication with the architect and the construction people. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next item 278, it looks like they have canceled, but do you need to read it? Yeah, I'll read it really quick. Uh, request of Susan Bladholm to address council regarding FY 2023-24 budget. Thank you. 379, please. Next. Request of Bob Savage to address council regarding effective date of banning tents in relation to safe rest villages. I believe Bob was planning to join us online, but I don't see them. They're not here. Let no. Let's see who's under the attendees. Bob, are you out there under a different name? Okay, I don't see them either. All right, good. Uh, next item, 380, please. Request of Chris Reed to address council regarding Southwest Capitol Highway Rose Lane project update. Good morning, Chris. How are you good today? Morning. Good, how are you? My name is Chris Reed. I am one of the owners and also manage 52% of the commercial property in the Hillsdale Town Center. I come today on behalf of Hillsdale business owners and residents to give you an update on the Capitol Highway Rose Lane project. When the project was originally presented to us, we feared the lane would detour customers from crossing over the, to enter the Southside Hillsdale Shopping Center. This is exactly what has happened. The Southside Shopping Center has 18 businesses, 15 of them, 83%, are small locally owned shops. 33% of those report a drop in sales since the lane was installed, with a decline as much as 18%. With TriMets recently re announced service changes reduction uh, route of routes in Southwest Portland, bus transit is far less accessible. Further, few people are riding buses due to the Southwest steep terrain and the lack of safe, family-friendly bicycle infrastructure. Southwest Portland is becoming a more car dependent with no re reasonable alternatives. It makes no sense to constrain key transportation arterial for a small benefit of bus ridership. Our original concerns regarding the project have come true with several new issues arisen. We did not foresee the dangerous hazards that the Rose Lane has caused for both drivers and pedestrians. Increased greenhouse gra gases, which violates a, CK, a key city goal. Increased infrastructure and in increased Frustration in drivers getting to and through Hillsdale, resulting in an increased accidents and road rage. Use of the Rose Lane as a raceway, making it dangerous for drivers, especially for pedestrians, who have an increased anxiety about the safety of crossing Capitol Highway, and a greater negative impact on the Hillsdale businesses than anticipated. Peabot's goal of the lane was to shave two minutes off of the travel time through Hillsdale during peak traffic times. What has happened instead is that by restricting automobile traffic in one lane, traffic is backing up so far that the buses are delayed getting into their dedicated lane, and far more time in the lane is, is spent into the, by, by more time, takes more longer to get into the lane um, than the lane is supposed to be savings, saving their time. The goal of the Hillsdale Rose Lane is failing. The eastbound Rose Lane, Hillsdale, 
eastbound Rose Lane through Hillsdale is absolutely devastating our local businesses. The westbound lane is causing cars to divert from Hillsdale completely, resulting in lost revenue opportunities and causing disruption um, increase in residential traffic. The project is causing more harm than good, negatively impacting the Hillsdale community. We respectfully request that council reconsider the value of the, of the lane. We unequivocally ask you to please remove the lane as quickly as possible. Please save our businesses and stop the negative impact in Hillsdale and residential streets and community. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Sure, uh, Chris, thank you for uh, testifying today. Um, I am uh, well aware of your concerns around uh, the Rose Lanes in, in this neighborhood. I've gone out and talked to neighbors and done a site visit and I've talked to my bureau around it. Um, and I've asked the bureau to implement some changes that um, we're hoping will relieve congestion. So for example, we have gone in and basically tuned the traffic signals, which we're hoping, and I believe there's some evidence that it's already beginning to reduce um, some of the traffic congestion there. We'll also go in and do some striping on the roads to um, clarify when and where um, you can turn. Um, so we are watching those, we are implementing, we've implemented um, the light tuning project, we will be doing more striping, and I continue to evaluate this project. Um, I know I owe you guys an update, and what I will promise you is um, by, within a week, my within a week, I will have um, Shannon, who's my transportation person on my staff, reach out to you and other interested parties to give you a sense of where we are with our evaluation and what's likely to come next. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and Commissioner, uh, first of all, thank you for being uh, this engaged in this at a personal level. I actually really appreciate sure. that. And I've, I've always had sort of a general question, and, and yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot because it's not really a question to yeah. you as much as it is PBOT, but there, there was a lot of discussion about this before it was put in. And there were a lot of concerns that were expressed by the people in the immediate vicinity, yourself included. Indeed. And PBOT made certain representations about what the goals of the project were. I would assume they have a process to go back and evaluate whether or not those goals are in fact being achieved. And I would also assume that if the goals are not being achieved or it's not working the way PBOT had hoped and expected based on information they had at that time, that they would revise it. Is, is that a fair statement or do we know? Um, I can't I, I speak can to that from the director. Right? I can't speak to the past, but I can give you a sense of how, how I try to uh, manage the bureaus in my portfolio. Um, if we implement a change and it's not achieving the goals that we want, and indeed is doing um, maybe harm in the neighborhood, I am not um, afraid to uh, change course. Um, if you're doing the public's work, you're going to make some mistakes sometimes as you implement stuff. Um, the important thing is to lean forward, try to literally build a better city. Uh, and, and where you fail at, fail at that, recognize that, and adjust. Uh, you might have noticed me do that with Trash for Peace, where I think we had a great project working with the houselessness around um, um, environmental protections, but it just didn't work out the way we had hoped. Uh, and I would say the Rose, Lane, the Rose Lanes in this particular neighborhood kind of fall into a similar category where there are some important environmental goals. I'll remind you, uh, you know, um, you know, thanks to the leadership of everybody on this council and Commissioner Rubio in particular, we're trying to cut carbon emissions in this town by about 40% in the next seven years or so. That's a very heavy lift. It really kind of requires us to reimagine how we organize our lives. Uh, we've been sort of investing in that, um, into that goal over time. Um, at the same time, it requires a lot of adjustments. And uh, there are gonna be some situations where the investments that we make or the things we try just do not yield the results that we want. Um, and it is true, I've been out. Uh, you can see uh, with these particular lanes, there is, um, some congestion, especially as you go up the hill, and it is a little bit, or it is confusing in terms of how you um, actually pull into the in, into uh, some of these shops along the road. Um, one, I take very seriously. I know I need to get uh, right. If uh, we're definitely not going to stick with the status quo, thus kind of tuning the lights, the uh, um, improved uh, um, striping, and we're. 
going to continually tweak it and see if, if we're getting the results we want until we get it right, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll vouch for that. I've, I've watched you engage personally on this, and, and frankly, it's impressive as a colleague. I really appreciate it. Sure, 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 sure. Thank it's you. A, it's an we, important. We appreciate you, too. I appreciate the efforts, and I'll definitely keep you posted. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Hold me accountable, too. Pardon me? Hold me accountable, too. I, I, um, it's my job to get this right. All right. I appreciate awesome. it. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. We really appreciate it. Did any of the other folks show up who, who had not? Um, that's it. Bob Savage. No. All right. We'll go to the consent agenda, please. Have any items been removed from the consent agenda? Nothing's been pulled. Call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. All right. The consent agenda is adopted. We'll go back to the first time certain item on the agenda, please. Item number 381. Authorize eight grant or inter intergovernmental agreements related to the community watershed stewardship program for a total amount up to $100,000. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Environmental Services. Today's ordinance authorizes environmental services to allocate $100,000 to eight stewardship grants and numerous native plant certificates. These awards are important because they engage community members in one of environmental services' core missions, protecting the environment. Uh, here is some history on this project. Back in 1995, environmental services developed the Community Watershed Stewardship Program, which provides grants and technical assistance for community-led watershed projects. Since 1995, more than 340 projects have been funded through this program. This year marks the 28th time this council has awarded community watershed stewardship grants. This year's awards will help support small, hyper-local restoration, education, and leadership development projects. These projects include native, or planting native uh, vegetation, teaching stewardship of natural areas, cleaning up litter near waterways, and educating Portlanders about their natural world and watershed health. Four of this year's awardees are new to the program. Three of these serve uh, refugees from Eastern African nations, Slavic nations, and the Middle East. One serves black youth. Another group is returning to teach East Portland youth watershed science in a culturally uh, appropriate setting. And six projects involve environmental education and stewardship practices with hundreds of elementary and high school students. Today we have uh, three, I think, uh, uh, speakers who will tell us more about this ordinance. We have Daryl Houtman and Kathy Dang, uh, lead staff from Environmental Services Community Watershed Stewardship Program. Uh, I think online we have Professor Judy Blue Horse Skelton with PSU's Indigenous Nations Studies Department. And we have Bear, Cunningham Goodell, a PSU student and BES program intern. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here today, and I will turn the presentation over to our invited speakers. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kathy Dang with the QUISP team here today. Um, thank you, Commissioner Maps, for bringing this forward, and thank you, Mayor Wheeler and City Council members, for having us here today. It's good to be here and we're excited to share um, some great news about our upcoming grantees for the next fiscal year. Uh, next slide, please. Each year we come to council to request authorization for funds for QUISP grants, our community watershed stewardship program. In 2012, QUISP conducted an equity audit and incorporated leadership by underserved communities in its selection criteria. That practice continues today. This year's projects represent eight community organizations, and as mentioned, four of the awardees are brand new to QUISP, and six projects focus on environmental education with 228 youth. Activities will engage more than 500 adult volunteer hours, and these are from all areas of the city, with four organizations serving East Portland communities. We'll share more about these exciting projects in a moment, 
And now I'd like to introduce Professor Judy Bluehorse Skelton with PSU Indigenous Nation Studies Department to discuss our partnership. Tatsme we good morning. I'm Judy Bluehorse Skelton, Mimipu, Cherokee, and Assistant Professor in Indigenous Nation Studies. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, we're excited about the ongoing relationship, our intergovernmental agreement with the folks at the Bureau of Environmental Services, but really excited about the opportunities that our Indigenous Nation Studies students have as internships with the staff and with the community that they're engaging with in the Portland metro area on water and centered on communities who may be new to the area and are um, learning for the first time about our waterways, about our native plants and how we have lived here in a good way for a long time. The engagement with BIPOC communities um, has also been a healthy uh, healing process. The community and the relationships are long-term. The opportunities for um, Quetzpali Reyes and Bear Cunningham Goodell this cycle have been uh, really exciting and um, just want to stress that as we look at um, climate changing, uh, we're in it right now, and over the years, um, how people can stay resilient, how our urban community of plants and waterways can stay healthy and resilient to heat change. Um, our students are part of that conversation and they're sharing indigenous, traditional, ecological and cultural knowledge as part of the work they bring to the city's Bureau of Environmental Services when they're engaging with um, diverse communities and the K through 12 and uh, college age and community folks. So we're really excited for our relationships um, and appreciate the commitment um, of the staff, Daryl and Kathy, Jennifer Devlin, and so many others in this program over the years. So really happy to be here and um, thank you. Katsiyaya. Thank you, Judy. And next slide, please. Advance one more. Yeah. Advance one more. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm I'm Bear. Uh, I use they them pronouns, and I'm a senior at Portland State. I'm uh, the 2023-2024 fiscal year intern for the Community Watershed Stewardship Program, and I will be speaking on the projects that we're hoping to fund this year. Um, so first off is the Black Men in Training, which will provide environmental education that prepares older Black teens to lead and share knowledge with younger youth. BMIT staff will accompany a culturally specific naturalist as youth learn about their natural world and watershed health. The Columbia Slough Watershed Council will work with community members to restore boat launch area to preserve tree canopy and improve freshwater resources along the Columbia Slough. This project includes youth workforce development with interns from Park Rose High School. Next slide. The Division Midway Alliance will build on an existing youth environmental leadership program to involve East Portland refugee youth in learning and sharing about watershed concepts with culturally relevant instruction. Youth will visit Leach Botanical Garden, create a mural, and coordinate a neighborhood cleanup day. The Ethiopian and Eritrean Cultural and Resource Center will recruit and train ambassadors to provide environmental knowledge to the community. Participants will include youth, mothers, and seniors with special focus on youth engagement and environmental responsibility. Next slide. The Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership will provide the connecting students with science curriculum to elementary schools. Environmental educators and school teachers will work together to deliver local ecology lessons in class, followed by a field trip and hands-on restoration project in Forest Park. Portland Refugee Support Group will educate refugee youth about their new environment, offer tools for environmental responsibility, and share this knowledge with their communities. 
Activities include workshops, visits to Tryon Creek Watershed, and native planting projects at Leach Botanical Garden. Next slide. The Slavic Community Center of the Northwest will create a gathering garden for community healing, planting viber viburnum, a native plant to Portland and a symbol of the courage of the Ukrainian people. Participants will work with the Columbia Slough Watershed Council to clean up a boat launch area on the slough and create a welcoming space for all. Then last we, lastly, we have Solve, which will partner with Dignity Village to plan and implement two litter cleanups near waterways of the Columbia Slough. Dignity Village will help communicate with people living in the area about the events and provide outreach support and services during events. This concludes our presentation. We would like to thank you again for this opportunity. This time, we'd like to turn it over to comments or questions from Commissioner Maps or the rest of council. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, number one, I want to thank our panelists for the presentation. I want to uh, share with everyone, you can hear my voice, how excited I am about this program. I'll tell you, uh, um, this is just a really smart and efficient way to get the community involved in our core mission of protecting the environment. I'll also point out that um, I know many of the uh, um, programs that have received awards this year, as I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, it's great to see so many in such a diverse array of communities involved in this work. I just want to thank staff um, and everyone else who helped uh, make this happen. I'm not sure if we have public testimony on this today. I suspect that we do not. No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll hand it back to you. Very good. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just throw in, well, Commissioner Ryan, why don't you go first? Your hand was up. Go for it. First of all, uh, thank you, Mayor. That was a great presentation. And also, uh, Judy, uh, Professor uh, Blue Horse Skelton, thank you for your presentation. I, at the beginning, Commissioner Maps, it, it, this program has been going on a while, and it's great. Yep. And it said how many awards have been given out, how much money has been invested. And then I hear snippets of impact. But my suggestion would be um, in that slide, it would say something to the a point about some of the results that we've received from these. And I can tell that some of them seem to, I almost said vibe off of one another. Um, they, they work with one another. There's partnerships. And so I'd like to hear more of those stories as we go forward. And then my next question, yep. this is now a question, is PCEF, when I listen to PCEF grants and I listen to this, there's similarities. Is there an overlap? Is there leveraging going on that I don't know about? There's, there's actually uh, one overlap this year, uh, this fiscal year. You know, I think PCEF spans multiple fiscal years. Uh, QUISP is uh, tied to the fiscal year. Uh, and so during the, the uh, period of fiscal year 24, there is one. It's the uh, Ethiopian Eritrean uh, Service Group. Um, and they, they are a PCEF grantee, and then uh, they're the services that they'll be uh, providing um, are uh, separate services in addition to what the P uh, sub grants will fund. That's a great example, Eric. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I think the public wants to keep learning more about how we're one expending the, their investments and then how we're getting leverage and impact out of it. So I just didn't want to miss the opportunity to connect some dots here. Yeah. Happy to do that. Absolutely. These are great programs, and I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming in today. And I just want to say I was smiling when you called the program Quisp. I'm of a certain age, which is old, and it was my favorite breakfast cereal. Oh, yeah. And if you don't know what Quisp is, it's because you're too young and you missed out on a great thing. Uh, but the, these are terrific programs, and, and uh, Commissioner Ryan, I, th I thought your, your comments were, were really good just in terms of uh, the depth of information that we can glean. I suspect these are very successful programs. And uh, I'm just really uh, glad that we're able to do it and partner with you. And Commissioner Maps, thank you for, for of course. your leadership on this and bringing this forward. So this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and all of a sudden, it's, I think it's time for Quisp to make a comeback. <laughs> I always felt like that vote was rigged, the one between Quisp and Quake, but it's for a different day. All right, we'll move on to the regular agenda, please. Item 386. Accept the Police Accountability Commission quarterly report for January through March 2023. Thanks, Keelan. Colleagues, we have with us today Samir Kanal from the Community Safety Division to introduce this quarterly report for the Police Accountability Commission. Thank you for being here. Welcome. 
Thank you very much for the welcome and good morning, Mayor Wheeler. Good morning, uh, Council President Ryan. Good morning, Commissioners Maps, Rubio, and Gonzalez. Um, the quarterly report for the Police Accountability Commission for January to March 2023 will be presented by the co-chairs of the commission. I'll pass it over to co-chair Tim Pitts to get us started. Thank you so much. Yes, hi. Thank you to the City Council for allowing us the opportunity to present the quarterly report of the Police Accountability Commission covering January through March 2023. My name is Tim Pitts, and I am a co-chair of the Police Accountability Commission for the transition plan and broader system phase of work, which began earlier this month. I'm joined virtually by Christian Oriana Bauer, my colleague as co-chair for this phase. I'm also joined by Casey Lewis, Catherine McDowell, and Tirsa Oriano, who were co-chairs during previous phases of the work that this report is reporting on. This quarterly report has three sections. The first covers the end of the powers and duties phase of the commission's work, which occurred in February. The second covers the portion of the next phase, structure and details, which occurred during this quarter. And then the third section addresses the commission's request for support from city council. While we'll be talking in general terms about what some of the documents include, we won't get very specific today due to time. However, there's a city council work session on the Police Accountability Commission next Tuesday, the 23rd, in which we'll get into the details. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm Christian, just for context. Um, in uh, November 2020, 82% of Portland voters supported a ballot measure that authorized a new community police oversight board to both replace the current system of administrative investiga uh, investigations, discipline, and accountability, and allow for a greater community voice in the policies and directives of Portland Police. The Police Accountability Commission was created by the City Council to develop the parameters and details of the Community Police Oversight Board and thereby implement this new section of City Charter. I think someone's speaking but is on mute, maybe? Is that what's oh, yes. happening? That was me. Okay. Sorry. Um, the commission self-organized through March uh, 2022 from April through mid-October. The commission researched and heard from experts and affected parties identifying barriers and best practices to police accountability, as well as ideas from subject matter experts and other jurisdictions to consider implementing in the new uh, system in Portland. After that, the commission moved into the powers and duties phase, which began in late October and ended in February. This phase worked on the functions of the new system, what it will do. Finally, the commission in February began the structure and details phase, which focused on the form the new system will take, how it's set up to do what it needs to do. We did not hold any briefings in these three months, but we did schedule a couple that occurred in the following quarter. We'll talk about those, including our briefing with the with City Commissioner Renee Gonzalez in our next quarterly report. The commission held 26 events in this three month period, which means the PAC remained one of the most active parts of city government. In fact, at the end of this quarter, the PAC had held 99 total events. Um, the powers and duties phase outcome documents are not final code recommendations, um, but they are the beginnings of those recommendations. Uh, they are sets of shared understandings among members as to the new system's powers and or what the new system powers and duties should be. The intention is that this draft uh, for revision based on discussion of other on other issue areas, um, community and council feedback and legal advice that will be converted into a code recommendation in the last few months of the Police Accountability Commission's work. Um, there were three outcome documents for this phase, uh, which collectively were the functions of the new systems or what will turn into the function of the new systems. Um, the first was about how the system will have access to information so it can perform its other duties. Um, the second was about how a complaint alleging officer misconduct will be handled. And the final document is on policy recommendations and other structural oversight issues or how those will be addressed. The uh, City Council tasked the Police Accountability Commission with developing a more detailed explanation of how 
powers of the new oversight system will function, including power to compel testimony and method of obtaining testimony, access to police records, evidence, and data, and access to police databases as authorized by federal and state law. Based on that, the Commission has created areas of agreement on access to information, which discusses how the oversight board and staff will get the information they need to be successful. This includes implementing portions of the charter text, compelling evidence related to administrative investigations, compelling police to participate in investigations, subpoenaing witness testimony, records, and recordings, access to other records, including statements and police reports. There's also a section on data privacy, management and confidentiality. And finally, there's a section on body-worn camera footage access and use in the administrative investigations led by the oversight board. Sorry, I had myself muted, apologies. Um, the second document was on officer accountability. What happens when there is a complaint saying an officer committed misconducts? Um, we are not going to go into a ton of detail here because we'll explain more next Tuesday. Uh, but in brief, the Police Accountability Commission developed a system where a person can file a complaint and the new oversight board does an intake interview. The complaint can be investigated, after which a panel of the oversight board can make findings as to whether or not what happened was misconduct. If it was, then corrective action can be issued in response. Um, both, complaint, both complainants and officers also have the right to appeal instead of going through the full process. A complaint can, uh, instead of going through the full process, a complaint can request, a complainant can request to speak to the officer supervisor or mediate directly with the officer themselves. Uh, this system is designed to be more straightforward, comprehensive, and supportive of complainants. It also addresses situations where a person complaining that an officer did something wrong or when a person uh, who files a complaint uh, that an officer didn't do something they were supposed to do, like neglect of duty, um, is addressed. Yeah. Good morning, I'm Catherine McDowell. I use she, her pronouns, and I was one of the co-chairs of our last phase of work. In our work, we've identified a lot of barriers to police accountability in the current system, and in this phase, we work to build a system that responds to those barriers. Some key changes were, one, adding more support people for everyone going through this process, including an advocate from beginning to end. That was a recommendation we directly heard from the community when we went through um, the briefings that we were asked to do by the council. Any potential misconduct that includes a community member would go through the same process, avoiding some of the confusion and back and forth investigations between different entities in the current system. Again, we heard from many um, folks about the complexity of the current system, work to try to integrate a single system going forward. Third, increase resources for services like mediation for advocates and more. And then fourth, and importantly, as envisioned by the charter, it will be community members, not police, who will decide if police committed misconduct. Let's see if co-chair Casey is present. Apologies, I was on mute. Um, so we also worked to make sure that issues that are identified by the board can be addressed not just on an individual, but on a systemic level. Um, so the um, Structural Oversight Subcommittee uh, looked at how to uh, create a system by which policy recommendations could be made by the board. Um, that committee was very aware of sort of the narrow scope of work that uh, has been asked of the PAC um, and uh, also aware of some of the mandates that City Council has uh, given us. Um, and so we created a process by which policy recommendations can be implemented or initiated um, through which the board can uh, review and approve of those recommendations. Um, and then uh, the resources and processes through which the board will be able to conduct research and analysis 
on information that becomes available to it um, during the course of the work that it is doing. Um, and then uh, also looking at the process by which the police bureau must respond to recommendations made by the board and uh, by which those recommendations can ultimately be brought to city council um, if the police bureau chooses not to implement them. Uh, so again, this is something that we go into in significantly more detail in the actual areas of agreement and something that will be converted into actual city code language going forward. Um, and we look forward to discussing it more at the work session next week. Okay, we're going to pause here and take any questions from city council members and then discuss the next phase of work. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Maps, why don't you go and I'll follow up. Sure. Um, thank you for the presentation and the work here. Um, I have a couple of just implementation questions as we move forward. Um, I'm interested in the ideas that you proposed around subpoena powers. Uh, um, and I just have to confess I haven't had to work in this policy area uh, um, that much. It's not clear to me where council's authority here, how we're limited or whatnot. I, I feel like as a member of council, I don't have a lot of subpoena powers myself. Uh, um, so can you provide some context? Like how does this work? Is this state, is this ordinance? Is this state law? How does this, yeah, yeah. you get the, you get, you, yeah. Um. I can give a partial answer to that question. So, uh, and, and perhaps uh, Co-Chair Casey may want to add more as well on that, or Co-Chair Catherine as well. Um, under the charter section 2-1007A, it says that the board shall have the full, have the power to the full extent allowed by law to receive and investigate complaints, including the power to subpoena and compel documents and to issue disciplinary action, and it continues on. Um, and the the purpose of the, the text that the commission was working on was to uh, find a way to put that, uh, to detail that in city code. Um, we're in the process of uh, having uh, outside legal counsel uh, get contracted and review this along with the city attorney's office to, to ensure that everything is in line with, with the state law in particular um, on that. But um, I think that's sort of the, the context and where it came from. It's also referenced in, in council resolution. Three seven five four eight. Um, Co-chairs, did you want to add anything? No. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. And I think the message here is we got lawyers uh, uh, who are working on it, and I look forward to reading the, those reports. Um, second question is, how much of this, if any, needs to be bargained with relevant unions, or do we know, or is this out? There? Yeah. Some of it has already been bargained. Um, for example, the, the April, which occurred outside of this quarter, the April agreement with the PPA on body-worn cameras, there was a reference that the commission made in February in the document to having administrative investigators have access, and that independently ended up in the, in the um, draft deal that was uh, released. So I think part of it is that, and the rest is that the implementation for this timeline may coincide with the beginning of bargaining. Um, with at least the PPA. I can't speak to the PPCOA as much. Um, but, but certainly there is an opportunity to connect those two paths. Okay, so it sounds like this is bargainable to some, to some degree and we'll, uh, um, I don't know if, that, if it's at the work session or uh, some point in the future, it would be good to uh, check in with HR or to learn more about how that landscape works. I have no idea. Um, and, Can um, I just um, sure. add to that? Um, we, you know, as we were going forward, we, we've raised that question internally many times. You know, what is the scope of our authority here? We know what the um, charter yeah. amendment says, but what do we do from there? And what we've ended up um, kind of doing as just a working model is our recommendations often say to the extent allowable by law, collective bargaining agreements, et cetera, understanding that we're making recommendations, but they will need to be checked by council to ensure, you know, that that the recommendation we're making fits within the legal framework. And that is really something we're looking at for our sixth and final phase sure. where we have independent counsel who can review that. So I would say at the end of this process, I think we will have that tightened up a little bit. That is a 
I think what we're planning to do in our final stage is all of those comments that we made sort of subject to, you know, to the extent allowable by law, we're going to check that and then try to be more specific with the help of counsel in that final stage. Great. Thank you uh, very much for that clarification. Um, and the last implementation question I have is, do we have a sense of how much this will cost? The, to clarify, the, the implementation or the oversight board itself? How about both? Um, and when we're, we're literally later on today, we'll, we're doing some stuff for the upcoming fiscal year and come October, we're basically back at the uh, drawing board for the ne next budget. Um, I assume you're fine for um, this year's budget. Uh, can, yeah, can you give us a sense of the, of what our um, short-term implementation costs are likely to be and what our long-term um, costs for running this new oversight system is likely to, to fall? I think we have more clarity on the second half of that question than okay. the first. Um, <clears throat> because uh, in the proposed budget, a lot of the funding is not yet described for next fiscal year. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk about that coming up too. Um, but with relation to the oversight board itself, including all of the staff that will report to it, um, the charter mandates a minimum of 5% of the police bureau's annual budget to fund um, the oversight board. So the commission has been working on the working assumption of roughly a comparable level of police bureau funding to what currently exists and at roughly $249 million, that means that the oversight board would have at minimum $12.45 million per year. Uh, for all of its activities. And then certainly if, if the oversight board uh, wanted to request more, um, and we'll get to this in the work session, then, then that would be council's prerogative on an annual basis, just like any other uh, part of the city to, to decide whether or not to, to give more or not. But the charter, and it's uh, section uh, 2-1004, says that it'll be uh, no less than 5% of the police bureau's annual operational budget. So 12 million. That's kind of a lot of bodies. Have you thought about literally, like, where do these people, where are their desks going to be? Have we gotten that far? Uh, yeah, that's outside of this quarter. It happened in April. Um, so we'll definitely have a lot of it um, in um, the work session on Tuesday, if that's okay. But we have sure. sort of a presentation on that plan as well. And maybe we'll get this to this at the work session on Tuesday. So a $12 million ongoing budget. Uh, what? what I can kind of do the math knowing my bureaus a little bit. Um, how many FTE would we imagine you buy for 12 million? So the commission has not explicitly come to a, a final number on that. Uh, they are, if I can clarify, be they're being deferential to the oversight board in terms of determining their own staffing structure to some degree. But as a working assumption, I believe it was somewhere, just in terms of average cost, divided somewhere in the 50 to 56 FTE range. Um, if a proportional percentage went to that, that doesn't, it would go down from that number. That would be a maximum because there's other uh, obligations that the current oversight system has. There's office expenditures, et cetera. So not all of the budget would go towards personnel is the yeah. anticipation. But that's a working assumption. There's in no way a recommendation or a um, or a hard and fast commitment. Sure. Um, and uh, um, do we know are are these folks? I'm not quite sure what the, what this 50 to 56 people will will be doing. Do we expect them to be represented, like you, in a union, or do you think they're going to fall outside of a union? I don't believe that that's been discussed in any way at the commission okay. to date. All right, uh, certainly colleagues, as we implement this, we should think about um, the space implications of this, the um, ongoing um, fiscal implications. Um, I certainly have questions about uh, how subpoena law works and um, and there are a bunch of labor issues, um, that, especially as we're standing up a, a substantial new branch of government that um, we should certainly think about because uh, essentially the entire city is unionized at this point. So this is our new reality. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have no more questions. I have I have a couple. Um, actually, I have a caution. I don't have I don't have questions as much as I have cautions. I mean, the, the conversation we just had is is merely one. 
My concern is this, and uh, I understand the public has spoken. More than eight out of 10 voters in our city said this is what they wanted, and for better or worse, this is what they're gonna get. My question is around legitimacy. When it comes to police oversight, we have seen specific examples where police oversight boards have exploded in spectacular style due to a loss of legitimacy. And I would put COEB up there as exhibit A. My concern is that if this is not seen as a balanced, fair approach to oversight and accountability, it will quickly be seen by the public and by our employees as an illegitimate process. And then we'll have a major mess on our hands that we will have to sort out. Because as Commissioner Maps has just suggested, it's even more complicated than that because we are going to be leaving one trapeze behind while we jump for the new trapeze. IPR will be gone and we will be left with the model that you are putting together. And therefore, there is a 100% certainty that it has to work. And from where I sit today, I just want to express, as police commissioner, my deep concerns about legitimacy. I want to acknowledge the hard work you've done. I think you've all put more than your fair share of work into this. And I know you've taken it seriously, and I know you understand the issues. And I really applaud the efforts you've put into this. But I cannot underscore enough how as you get into the implementation phase, the public will be looking for the legitimacy of this process. And they will be looking to see who's running it, who's making the decisions. You just said today that the police are structurally excluded from decision making or input in this model. And I assume you think that's a good thing. I would actually say that's a cautionary red flag in my opinion, uh, because any process of jurisprudence always includes more than one perspective. So I just want to put that out there right now. The budget thing, I have a whole separate process in my head that I'm not going to get into today. But I, I just want to caution you, when more than eight out of 10 people say they want something in an election, we have examples that when people see what is actually being implemented, they might change their mind if they don't see this as a legitimate process. So this is not personal. I, I know each and every one of you have, have put a lot of time, energy, and effort, blood, sweat, and tears into this, and I really respect you and appreciate you for it. But I also don't want two years from now somebody saying, how could you guys not have seen this mess coming if it goes the way I think it could go if we're not diligent? Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have a question just you know, following this line of, of conversation too. Just for co comparison, can you tell me, or do you happen to know what the budget of IPR and staffing is just for my comparison in my head? The budget of IPR uh, is roughly three and a half million dollars per year. The budget for internal affairs is roughly three million dollars per year. And uh, the budget for this would be, assuming police funding levels stay roughly comparable, $12.45 million a year. Um, and there are some uh, responsibilities that uh, might shift around. Um, the, and the FTE for IPR, do you know that? How many staff? I don't recall. I, I'm sorry, I do not recall the number okay. off the top. I think it was 12. 12, yeah. okay. Um, my other question is about the oversight board, and I understand this might be discussed also at the work session, but can you talk to me a little bit about what you're thinking and that appointment, and especially, um, yeah, in light of what the mayor just said, what does that representation and composition look like? Yeah, so that is something that um, was, was resolved by the commission in April. And so it's uh, not in this report because it just goes through March. And so we'll definitely go there. There is a uh, definitely 
some, some restriction, and this goes to, to the mayor's question as well. Um, it wasn't the PAC that actually decided that it would be um, community members exclusively making the determinations. That's in the charter language and uh, resolution 37548. The decision placed before the commission was to determine whether the full board or a subset thereof would make the decisions on findings. And the charter says that the, uh, the board members cannot include police. So that, that was the options given to the, the commission. Um, similarly, there are uh, restrictions in the charter about uh, who can be on a member of the board, one of which is uh, that police, current police, former police, and the family members of current police are not eligible for service. That is in the, uh, the charter text. And um, then in terms of the representation, uh, it, it talks about uh, the board shall make provisions to ensure its membership includes, includes representation from diverse communities, including those from diverse communities and with diverse experiences, particularly those who've experienced systemic racism and those who've experienced mental illness, addiction, or alcoholism. Council asked to put uh, that the commission set requirements for the initial appointments um, as well and the commission developed a, a broader uh, list of, of sort of the makeup desire to ensure balance and also to ensure that um, this is something that can represent not merely the 82% of voters who voted for it, but 100% of Portlanders um, over, over the course of its lifespan. Um, and I, if I can just add one other point on the um, legitimacy there are a couple places when we'll talk on, on uh, Tuesday about that the over in the officer accountability document, there are places where the um, commission's language talks about an equal level of support. Each, each uh, officer has a, an equal number of support people to complain it through the process. And there's a lot of places where there's mirroring language like that, um, that will definitely, the commission co-chairs will be developing uh, in more detail on Tuesday. Okay, so I, I look forward to the conversation on Tuesday. I just wanted to make sure, and, and you said it, so I look forward to hearing more about it, about um, I think myself and probably a, a couple others have mentioned the need for balance, just to, for the reasons that uh, the mayor just outlined. And so um, thanks for saying that, and I'll look forward to the conversation. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Similar to what the mayor was talking about, I think you've heard me express similar points of view about the fact that 82% voted yes for police accountability, and that's a really diverse group of people that voted yes on this. And so last time we were here, and then in follow-up, I said, are you reaching out to some of those groups that perhaps aren't at your table right now who <clears throat> endorsed um, this when it was on the ballot, and the Portland Business Association was one of those. Did you all have a meeting with them recently? Is that okay? Did, did you get any feedback that was helpful and what was that dialogue like? Yes, I, Commissioner Ryan, I would just say I attended that meeting and I thought it was very helpful. Um, you know what, um, I guess what I would say is one of the themes that we have heard is, um, you know, some communities feel over-policed, some feel under-policed, and um, we heard that from the business community loud and clear that, um, you know, there are times where they need additional support and don't feel like they're getting it. So that was one of the messages we got from the business um, community. Um, I would say in general they, um, I guess, consistent with their support for the measure, seemed supportive and interested in our work um, and did not raise red flags at this stage around, um, you know, what we talked about. and. Um, it was as much a listening session as a reporting session, but the concerns that we heard were um, that they felt like a functional um, police bureau was critical to the business community and um, a functional police force could not occur without accountability. So that the message that I think led them to support the measure in the first place is what we heard, at least for me, that was the prime takeaway from that meeting. And I appreciate your um, suggesting that meeting we had already had it in the works, but I think your suggestion um, helped us put it together with the Business Alliance. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate this dialogue. And I wanted to make sure that I was really in the same uh, tone as what the mayor was getting at. And I want to make sure that we, I heard a concrete example of doing just that. Um, <clears throat> the conversation that we had about police, the charter said police and their families can't be on the commission. 
<clears throat> my question would be how we all, I think we'd all agree they're stakeholders, police and their families, and, and I heard that from you, Samir. So how are we going about keeping that point of view active in this, in this uh, development as we build this? Even though there's a, it looks as so we voted on something that says it can't be on it. But would you agree they're stakeholders? Absolutely, okay. and we have conferred with them and look forward to conferring with them further. Um, you know, the, the tricky, um, I, I just, my, when the mayor was talking about legitimacy and concerns about specific aspects of our work, I mean, my, I guess my, um, what was in my mind is something that uh, Commissioner Gonzalez said to us when we um, chatted with him, I think it was last month, around fidelity to the measure. And so we're trying to balance all this. I mean, the measure says what it says about really wanting a clearly independent board and setting aside a certain budget amount. We have really, in our work, we're, we're really looking at those as givens. We don't have the discretion to rewrite this measure. Our work is to implement the measure um, in the best way, in the wisest way we can, according to its terms. And its terms dictate independence um, from the police bureau, and its terms dictate a certain level of funding. So within those parameters, we're going to bring you recommendations that seek to implement those as well as we can. Now, what we would love to do, particularly as we move into this fifth and sixth stage, which are really our wrap-up stages, is go back through that briefing process that we um, conducted earlier now that we have some concrete proposals and get feedback. So we begin with feedback, getting feedback from you all next week, and then look forward once we try to incorporate your feedback, going out and doing all those briefings again with various uh, members of um, the police community. Um, I think the only um, police entity we have not heard from yet is the Commanders Association. Uh, we've heard from everybody at least once, in some cases more than once, and um, certainly look forward now that we are, have something to talk with them about, recommendations to talk with them about, getting their responses to those recommendations, and then incorporating them in our final recommendations in the sixth phase of our work. I like this. Catherine, you're reminding me we're having a work session next week on this topic. So this yeah. is a bit of a preview. Well, it's um, good to prime the pump, I think. Yeah, I tend to, I know these are rear view mirror moments, and <coughs> that's hard for me. I barely use it when I drive. Yes. Um, yes. And so it's always about, you know, for me going forward. So I realize I will um, hold back, and I look forward to next week's work session. Perhaps this is a little bit of a preview. Thank you all for your service. I did want to acknowledge that. It's a lot of hours. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Rubio. Uh, and then Commissioner Ryan, you had already, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Thanks. Well, again, I want to thank you all for your work. And I, 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 I just have one last observation, as much as to my colleagues as, as to you all. Um, we have, we are dealt a hand where we are implementing a number of ballot measures, referendums, and like as a city right now. Charter reform, PAC, um, we also are dealing with the impacts of a number, a number of other ballot measures that have long shadows, uh, whether you're talking metro taxes, county taxes. And um, I, I guess the question for us is, how do we assure fidelity to what voters approved? But as elected officials, when we see unintended consequences of what was approved, when we recognize that what was adopted in 2020 um, by voters is a very different city and frankly a, a very different voting base a, as exists in 2023, um, how do we adjust and assure fidelity and how do we adjust and respect the you know the legal structure in which we're operating? And so that is an open-ended, mm -hmm. somewhat abstract question but we deal with this every single day right now and uh, are trying to respond to some of the crisis we see on our streets in 2023 while we're dealing with the shadows of 2020 uh, in many, many respects. And um, that's not entirely on you to navigate. Uh, that's as much a question to the electeds here on how we reconcile sometimes the conflicts that result from that. Um, my only ask of you is that uh, uh, in a, 
is that you, as you're identifying things that upon reflection are uh, maybe structural problems in what the voters approved, uh, please help sort of catalog them for us and not because it's on you to fix them. I think that's on us to address uh, one way or another. Um, but I, I leave it with that. Well, there, there's, there's a self-corrective mechanism here too, which is if what ultimately gets rolled out doesn't work or doesn't comport with what people believe they supported, it will be repealed. I mean, it, it, there is nothing the city is more concerned about right now than public safety. I mean, homelessness is obviously our biggest social challenge, but public safety is front and center right now. And if people feel that we are messing with public safety or we are in any way weakening it or making it less effective, they will react. And so for, for me, this is a really important project that you're working on. It has to be executed perfectly. And so I'm raising my red flags now not to criticize your work. I agree with what you said, that, that there has to be fidelity to what the voters support. I agree, it's, and it's a tough ask. Well, and I also think that um, police accountability is a critical aspect of public safety. And that is, I think that's the premise of 82% of people voting for a more effective accountability system. I, I agree with you, but then you have to ask the follow-up question. What is accountability? And how does accountability work? And is the process balanced? And is it fair? And I'm even just thinking of logistical problems. I don't know how we're going to solve them. If, if this independent body, separate from us, separate from the police bureau, separate from any government entity, has the ability to demand any document, the ability to subpoena any of our public employees with no check and balance, that does not feel fair. That does not feel balanced. It feels, as an employer, extremely concerning, to be perfectly honest. And I don't even know what the DA thinks about this. If the DA is trying to conduct an investigation behind closed doors and collect information, documents, interview people, and then all of a sudden you have this separate group of people saying, no, we're going to do our own thing, and we're going to interview people, and we're going to hold public meetings, and we're going to collect documents, which then I presume become public record. I don't even know how that works. Um, but, you know, I, I, I guess the bottom line for me is rather than just sitting here and raising potential concerns and objections, help me help you. Let me know what you need from us, what we can, and that would be helpful if it was part of the work session, is we can reserve some of that time. What do you need from us? Because you are, you're doing a heavy lift here, and, and I think we all want it to be successful. So let, let us know how we can be of help. And I think there's a part of that that's in the part coming up just now, um, as well, the, the sort of look ahead, uh, also in terms of what the commission is asking for. So um, if that. Yeah, I think that's a good segue into um, the final part of our presentation, which is to update you on the most recent phase of work that we concluded, the phase, the structure and details phase um, for which um, Casey, Charlie, and I were co-chairs. And so um, if we could move to slide 10. Um, just a quick review about our six phases of work. You, you probably um, have that pretty well understood at this point, but just to be clear, the structure and details phase was our fourth phase and focused on the form of the new system. Um, and we'll be reporting on the first half of it today with the second half um, in our next quarterly report, which we won't be presenting until August, although you'll definitely get a preview of it all next week. Starting in May, the commission moved um, into our transition plan and broader system phase, which is the fifth of our sixth phases. Um, that's where we'll be developing the transition plan and how it fits into the broader system of city government. Um, again, that may answer some of your questions about how we get from IPR smoothly to the new system. I know that's going to be a critical um, piece both for you and with respect to the settlement agreement. 
Um, after that, the PAC will convert all of these agreements into code text, come to agreement to recommend all of that to city council at the end of um, August. We're also doing community engagement in parallel to everything um, throughout this process to ensure the community-led process that the council charged us with conducting and that we are also personally committed to. Commissioner Gonzalez. Did you have your hand up? I did, you know, and I, I, um, and I look forward to the work session addressing some of the mayor's last points and the collective questions up here. I, um, and I, I just want to observe that even if what we do here, it, there is a future opportunity for voters to unwind it. I, I continue to be have a concern that as elected, if we don't speak up and address things that we know right now that we are passing the baton un, uh, unreasonably onto whoever comes next. And again, that's more than the PAC. That uh, is a number of uh, items that we're left implementing right now at a very difficult time in the city's history. So I, um, I still, as the new guy, I'm still trying to reconcile how we address those things that are have been mandated by the voters that we may have seen some really, you know, unintended consequences and unforeseen impacts. Um, I don't have an answer on that. Just again, in the abstract, open-ended, putting that out there is what is our responsibility right now as elected, not as a as appointees. Um, and I leave that for my colleagues. Um, Commissioner Maps, sorry, didn't see your hand come up uh, there. Oh, that's all right. I'm debating. I'm debating whether or not I want to raise this now because I know we also have some public testimony on on this, uh, but maybe um, we and we have a work session coming up, um, and maybe to signal to staff and volunteers who are working on this and to my colleagues on council. Um, you know, I see lots of great ideas. Substantively, I don't think I have any sort of principled disagreements with where you're trying to go. Uh, here, lots of implementation issues, labor, subpoena powers, all that kind of stuff. And I think that if, you know, uh, people come together and work in good faith, we can lay it in a good spot here. But a piece here that I just, I don't know how we, given where we are, I don't know how we fix, but I, I kind of agree with Commissioner Gonzalez. There are some, uh, um, maybe a couple of existential issues here that I think might require some council leadership or at least some discussion at the work session. Um, and for me, the one that really uh, sticks into my craw and concerns me is the, the budget on this. Uh, I'm setting the budget at, for this automatically at at least 5% of the police bureau, police bureau's overall budget. Um, that's just an, an extraordinary budgeting practice, unlike anything I've seen in the city myself. You know, I would love to pass a rule that says the city spends 5% of our capital budget on, you know, asset management or something. Uh, but even some uh, common sense, like pretty uncontroversial practice like that is not how we do things. I recognize that, um, you know, the 5% at least was baked into the ordinance that went to voters. Um, I. To due diligence, I feel as a representative of the people, at least uh, a guy who um, is trying to to uh, um, manage the public interest really well, I need to let my constituents know that um, this law that you passed, especially on the uh, budget side, um, raises a lot of concerns and I think might actually be part of the discussion that we need to have as we move towards implementation. You know, um, yeah. It's not how we do anything else. Uh, I, I'm also keenly aware that um, the city of Portland is going to be under extraordinary financial pressures in the in the coming years. Um, Fifty employees is a lot, you know, uh, extraordinarily large compared to where we have been historically. Um, it seems to be independent of the amount of actual misconduct or even just business the police do. do. Um, th this piece causes me a lot of concerns. And I know the, c the commission has no, you were handed the mandate that you were handed and you were, you know, the voters passed this by a lot. But um, 
I, th I, I, I think I'm probably speaking to my colleagues here where I, I think that we should have some discussion ar around that, even if it just means that uh, you know, 5% will go here. It certainly has implications for the general fund as we move forward, and we have to maybe set some policies to adjust for that. Thank you. Keelan, how many people do we have signed up? We have one person signed Perfect. up. Perfect. Let's hear from them. Three Mark minutes, Porras. please. There, er, Hi, Mark. Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Can you identify okay. yourself for the record, please? Yep. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we continue to advocate for more opportunities for public input into city policymaking, and we are truly appreciative of the opportunity to testify on this report today. Uh, when we testified in favor of City Council adjusting the PAC's deadline from June 9th to August 31st, we said a few things. Uh, first, we thank Council for doing so. Second, we noted that the settlement agreement, as approved by Judge Simon, allowed the date to be as late as October 29th. Uh, and third, we asked for confirmation that moving the deadline once again to meet that later date would not require DOJ intervention, and it was stated on the record that it would not. Um, so we would like to remind you that if the Police Accountability Commission needs more time to finish their work, that council should extend again to October 29th. Um, the commission has had one empty seat since early March that city council hasn't yet filled. Uh, Portland Cop Watch has urged council over and over to let the PAC set its quorum based on the number of seated members. Uh, they should have been able to meet with only 10 members of the commission present these past several months. Uh, not only are they shorthanded, but the quorum is still 11. Uh, we're appreciative that the commission continues to hold community engagement events. Uh, one issue that continues to arise is that some folks attending these events don't have a good understanding that the PAC is not the new police accountability board, uh, but rather it is the body that's developing the new investigatory disciplinary and oversight system for PPB. And the city could be doing a better job of disseminating that message. And we urge city council to prepare to create the new oversight body such that there is minimal delay between when the Police Accountability Commission completes their work, when the plan is approved by City Council, the DOJ, and the court, and when the new oversight body begins their work. Um, and I just want to address some of the discomfort that I've heard regarding a civilian oversight board. Um, and I want to point out that when Chief Lavelle and Deputy Chief Frome appeared before the Police Accountability Commission, uh, DC Frome plainly stated that he and Chief Lavelle need to be removed from the discipline process in order to be able to speak freely. And also in the current system, uh, police have automatic access to representation from the start of the process. Uh, the Police Accountability Commission's proposal balances that for the community. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Does that complete that public complete testimony? testimony? Thank you. Um, so we're going to see you again soon. So uh, I, and I, I know we're not paying you particularly well for the service you're providing. Why don't we just uh, entertain a motion? So moved. Commissioner Ryan moves uh, the acceptance of the report. Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, thank you, all of you who uh, have been working so many hours, so many evenings. I really appreciate your devotion to our city. It's good to see you again, Catherine. I, I don't know how you do your other job, <laughs> your full-time <laughs> job. Anyway, it's really appreciated. I, I realized as we were having the dialogue that we do have a work session next week, and so I think that will be um, an awesome opportunity to go deeper on some of the topics. But the fact is you, you're spending a lot of time, you're moving this along. I remember when there was a backlog, so Samir and the staff, um, thank you for your extra hours to, looks like we're caught up, right? Yeah, anyway. That wasn't the case about six months or nine right. months ago. So I wanted to acknowledge that. Anyway, I accept the report. Gonzalez. I vote aye. Max. Uh, yeah, I want to thank the commission for their hard work. I want to thank staff and our invited uh, testimony today for today's presentation. Uh, I am glad to accept this report, and I look forward to our work session next week. Rubio. I just want to thank the commission uh, members, and I'm really glad that um, we had the extra time. Um, you're all so thoughtful and dedicated. This has been a long process, and uh, we're almost there. And just uh, keep going and really look forward to the work session where I know we'll, we'll dig in more on these issues, and I know you're not fully ready to talk about them today, so I want to appreciate that you indulged a lot of the questions today, and we look forward to the work session. I vote aye. Wheeler. I want to thank you all. Um, th this was a really good discussion today, and I'm, I'm happy that we have the opportunity for this discussion now to settle for a grand total of one week at least, and that we can come back and talk through some of the issues again in a work session. 
I want to thank you all personally for your commitment to this. Samir, you have done an outstanding job of leading this effort on behalf of the city. And I, I want to personally acknowledge your fantastic leadership on this. You've been very accessible. You've been very communicative. You've shared information that's been requested. And I, I just personally want to acknowledge that in public and thank you for your great work. I want to thank all members of the, the PAC because this is very complicated as, as uh, we get closer and closer to the very fine-grained specifics of this, it's going to get more complicated. And I think we all know that, we acknowledge it. So I'm appreciative of the fact that we can have frank and open discussions about it and everybody feels that all sides of this are being considered. And that's, to me, how we make good policy here. So I, I appreciate you indulging our myriads of questions, concerns, comments. Um, th this is the good stuff of government, and I thank you for it. I vote aye, and the report is accepted. Thank you. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, wait, before you guys leave, wait. We have, we have some young folks here with us. Where are you from? Oh. We have the Abernathy folks in the house. Thanks for being here. Wait, why they're here? There's a, it's a good opportunity to say, you know what Portland voters did last night? They approved the Portland Children's Levy. And that's, yay. yes, yay. yay. So thank you for being exhibit A to remind us that we always need to put our children first. Yeah, thank you for being here today. Thanks for visiting City Hall. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Next item, please. Item number 387, it's an emergency ordinance. Pay settlement of Donovan Farley bodily injury lawsuit for $50,000 involving the Portland Police Bureau. Colleagues, this ordinance resolves a claim brought against the city of Portland in June of 2022. Deputy City Attorney Mark Rodriguez and Senior Claims Analyst Rose Radich are here to walk us through the ordinance, or at least I hope they're here online. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and Council morning. members. Uh, my name is Mark Rodriguez, and I am the Deputy uh, City Attorney representing the city in the litigation of this matter. Settlement ordinance relates to a lawsuit that was filed in federal court as a result of a, pro a June 6, 2020 protest-related incident. In that incident, there was a protest that was declared an unlawful assembly. Uh, plaintiff was filming the Portland police officers making an arrest of a demonstrator when he had an interaction with a Portland police officer resulting in multiple uses of force against them. Uh, plaintiff alleges he was working as a journalist at the protest and the officer retaliated against him with unlawful force for doing his reporting. Um, plaintiff alleged that he suffered mental, physical, and economic harms, including mental anguish and anxiety, interfering with his ability to conduct his journalistic duties, in particular covering protest and law enforcement. The parties engaged in settlement discussions, including a judicial settlement conference mediated by a District of Oregon federal judge and ultimately reached a resolution supported by the city's risk management division, the Portland Police Bureau, and the city attorney's office. Settlement of this lawsuit will allow the city to avoid the expense of further litigation, including the cost of outside counsel for the individually named officer, the risk of an adverse jury verdict, and risk of paying plaintiff's attorney fees and costs if plaintiff prevailed on any of the federal claims. Uh, thank you and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, colleagues, any questions? Do we have public testimony on this item? We do, we have three people signed up. Uh, first up is Mark Porras. Um, yep, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Great, uh, hello again, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we have no objection to the city paying this $50,000 settlement for police brutality committed by Officer Cameron Smith on June 6, 2020. Uh, we do have an objection to calling this brutality an encounter, or as Mr. Rodriguez just said, interaction with a Portland police officer. A uh, beating or instance of brutality would be more accurate. Uh, we hope that Donovan Farley has fully recovered from his injuries and from the psychological stress that being attacked by a city employee can have on a person. Uh, we hope that Officer Cameron Smith understands that the $50,000 the city is paying out today is due to his actions. And if the name Cameron Smith rings a bell, it may be because he's the officer who fired a 40 millimeter less lethal round at Robert Delgado, who lay dead on the ground in Lentz Park after having been shot by Zachary DeLong in April 2021, just 10 months after he got away with this other unnecessary use of force. As we understand it from public records on June 6, 2020, Mr. Farley, a member of the media, was observing three officers with their knees on a man, one who had a knee on his neck, while the man was shouting that he couldn't breathe. 
As Mr. Farley shouted at the officers to get off the man, video shows that a fourth officer approached, smashed Mr. Farley in the lower thigh with his nightstick, sprayed him in the face with a crowd control sized canister of chemical spray, followed Mr. Farley, jabbing him with the baton as he walked away. And when Mr. Farley turned around, Officer Smith sprayed him in the face with chemicals again at close range. Mr. Farley wrote these words hours after he was assaulted by Officer Smith while he was still in tremendous pain from the beating and macing. He said, simply, I was chased and assaulted because I was a journalist who caught law enforcement behaving in the exact illegal fashion that started this nationwide uproar. There can be no equivocations about it. I was purposefully harmed to send an extremely painful message of intimidation. And so, yes, we understand that the parties have come to a financial agreement. And yes, we again urge you to engage and discuss the policies that lead to these settlements. This settlement raises the total paid out for protests between 2018 and 2020 to at least $1,254,405 now. The DOJ settlement agreement states that the city make available the number, nature, and settlement amount of civil suits against PPB officers, regardless of whether the city is a defendant in the litigation. We are still waiting for the city and the compliance officer to make these data readily available to the public as required. Uh, the ordinance states that the total cost to the city to settle Mr. Farley's lawsuit is $50,000. This amount completely disregards the time and money that risk management and city attorneys spent settling this case. Uh, Street Roots recently published data showing that the city spends more on paying its lawyers than it does making whole those who file civil claims. That should alarm everyone. Until this information is included on every settlement's impact statement, the public cannot begin to understand what the true financial cost is to perform policing the PPB way. Um, we would also like to remind you that when a $15,000 settlement came before you last month, resulting from the Bureau not having a clear policy on aiding with evictions, the mayor asked the city attorney who was present if that policy had changed and they said no. And that's exactly the kind of discussion we wish that we were hearing with every one of these settlements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up we have Brandon Farley, they were planning to join us online. I don't see them. Is Brandon here? Okay. How about Mark Lee? Also planning to join online. Is Mark here? All right. I think that completes the testimony. Very good. Before we get to the vote, uh, are you also from Abernathy? Which school are you from? Excellent. Welcome to City Hall. We really appreciate you being here today. How's your tour? Awesome. Good. Okay. That's good news. We like to hear that. Well, thanks for being here and welcome. Oh, not a, we, 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 we love to see the kids come through, so thank you. Any further discussion? See none? Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 388, please. This is the second reading. Amend contract with Gresham Automotive Incorporated, DBA Gresham Ford, to increase the not to exceed amount by $10 million for purchase of fleet vehicles. Colleagues, this is the second reading. We've already heard presentation and had opportunity for public input. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. I just want to thank the staff for answering our questions, and I feel like um, it's a good plan. I would I. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, please. 389. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Authorized competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder for construction of the Mount Scott Community Center Seismic Retrofit and Expansion Project for an estimated cost of $28,300,000. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, colleagues, the Mount Scott Community Center has served the Mount Scott Arlita neighborhood since the 1920s with that, when the outdoor pool was opened. Today, the facility provides a variety of healthy recreation and community gathering opportunities for <coughs> Southeast Portlanders. In addition to recreation opportunities, portions of the community center also shelter our most vulnerable community members during extreme temperature and weather events. These important services are, however, housed in an aging facility that needs seismic renovation, modernization, and expansion, a common theme with our infrastructure. There's another tour of children. Yay. You must be from Abernathy as well. Yeah. Yay. Welcome. Enjoy the drive-by. Okay. <laughs> and thank you, Portlanders, once again for passing the Portland Children's Levy last night. There you go. That's why we do it. Okay. I'm back on task. Um, these important services are, however, housed in an aging facility. I, 
uh, seismic renovation, modernization, and expansion. It's a real similar theme as we look at our infrastructure and our backlog of deferred maintenance. The Mount Scott Community Center Seismic Retrofit and Expansion Project helps to meet current and future recreational needs by expanding recreational opportunities, providing seismically resilient community center. The project's design also is focused on ADA accessibility barriers associated with the existing buildings. Before I turn it over to the project manager, I wanna thank um, the two park rangers who took me out there. Um, it was uh, Kelly and Celeste. We had a great conversation. Adam, who is the head of the uh, of Mount Scott Center, just was such a great host. And it was fascinating to see the uh, roller rink. I had no idea there was a roller rink in that basement. It's the other big one after Oaks Park, correct? That's yeah, so there's wonderful opportunities for families to rent that for birthday parties and such. I also want to acknowledge the, uh, the preschool teachers. The park rangers are always a hit when they go into the preschool classes to give out those stickers. Those stickers are really popular. Yeah. And I also wanted to acknowledge how many um, people that were there that used the facility during the day, a lot of elders. And they told me stories how when it was closed during COVID, how they really missed seeing one another and that they started connecting with one another and then started meeting outside of the center. And I'm sure it was just so organic with, by the time it opened because you had all these people gathering there because they missed one another. So it's just a reminder as we come out of COVID how important that in-person connection time is and how valuable that is to the mental health of all Portlanders and parks and recreation and these venues really bring that home. So now I get to turn it over to project manager Robin Laughlin for the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor Wheeler, members of council. My name is Robin Laughlin. I, am, I have she, her pronouns. I am also a fan of CWISP. So thank you for that. Uh, so I am the uh, Capital Renovation Program Manager with Portland Parks and Recreation, and I'm here today to request council, au council authorization uh, for a competitive bid solicitation and contracting with the lowest responsible bidder for construction of the Mount Scott Community Center Renovation Project. At the, uh, is there a slide show that you guys can see? We uh, sent that to the clerk Sorry. earlier. Thank you. If I can uh, pull up the next slide, please. Thank you. The Mount Scott Community Center is a 60,744 square foot facility located in the Mount Scott Arleta neighborhood at 5516 Southeast 72nd Avenue. Mount Scott Community Center had its beginnings as an outdoor pool in the 1920s and has expanded over time as the community has grown. Several additions through the 1950s and the pool replacement in 2000 are the foundation of the current facility. The next slide, please. These incremental additions over 90 years has resulted in, a, in an inefficient building that is constructed mainly of reinforced, unreinforced masonry with little capacity to provide adequate recreational programming to this growing Southeast Portland neighborhood. Mount Scott Community Center is representative of the city's aging infrastructure with a long backlog of deferred maintenance needs and nearly all of its mechanical systems at or past their useful life. The areas shown in hatched uh, orange on your screen are the areas um, that will be being demolished as part of this project and replaced with new modern facilities. And I'll have a little more of that on that in a moment. The next slide, please. The existing amenities at Mount Scott Community Center include an indoor pool, fitness rooms, a gymnasium, meeting rooms, locker rooms, and roller skating rink in the basement. <clears throat> the community center supports a broad range of recreation opportunities for visitors from preschool, teens, adults, and seniors, really serving the full community well. Again, roughly half of the existing facility is comprised of unreinforced masonry, and the proposed renovations will provide increased seismic resiliency for this facility. Among those areas slated for upgrades are the fitness room, uh, as shown in the middle photo, which is currently undersized for its use. These ex existing HVAC systems also are reaching the end of the useful life and will be replaced with modern, efficient systems. Next slide, please. Work on the Mount Scott Community Center project began in 2018 with the facility condition and needs assessment. Recommendations coming from that work were made in early 2020, and schematic design based on those recommendations began in July of 2021. 
The community engagement for this project design began in October of 2021 to help determine community needs and priorities. The public comments were received through a 30 question survey that was provided in five languages, English, Chinese, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. The survey was advertised through the project website, through lawn signs placed in the neighborhood, and through notices sent out to 1,400 people in the Mount Scott Park opt-in email contact list. An additional 6,500 households were reached via our nextdoor.com platform. The project team also worked with the City of Portland's Community Engagement Liaison Services Program to conduct additional outreach to communities who might be isolated due to language barriers. And we also had direct outreach with the Arleda Sun Community School, the Marysville Elementary School, Woodmere, Woodmere Elementary School, Lane Middle School, and Franklin High School. The input was used to inform the initial project design and following that work, a public open house meeting was held in September 24 of 2022 at Mount Scott Community Center to present the proposed design. The community feedback from that meeting resulted in a final preferred design that was moved forward to the construction documents that we'll be hoping to bid uh, later this year. That September 2022 meeting was also accompanied by an online survey presented in the same uh, language as we spoke to before. That was presented to the community from September 24th through October 10th. And throughout the design process, we worked at the Mount Scott Arleta Neighborhood Association and the Foster Powell Neighborhood Association. The Southeast Uplist and all Southeast Portland Neighborhood Associations are also via the um, email contact list. The next slide, please. So when construction is complete, uh, the Mount Scott Community Center will be 70,515 square feet and will provide an updated, modern, seismically resilient facility for the community. The existing auditorium, pool, gymnasium, locker rooms, and roller skating rink will remain. The project will include the following major elements, uh, demolition of that unreinforced masonry portions of the building, including the 1920s era bathhouse and the 1950s area auditorium and fitness rooms. 31,131 square feet of new, new construction, two stories, including fitness rooms, rental rooms, event space, and classroom spaces and, off and offices will be offered in the yellow and orange uh, areas shown on your screen. Next slide, please. The project will present a significant portion, uh, will address a significant portion of our major maintenance back backlog at this facility, including new roofing, HVAC, and fire, sprinkling, fire sprinkler systems. And the seismic upgrades will be made to the gymnasium uh, and the roller rink areas. Our exterior improvements include new entry plazas, parking lot upgrades and lighting, landscaping, right-of-way dedication, and necessary public street improvements. As Commissioner Ryan mentioned, during severe weather events such as high heat, ice, and heavy snow, this community center opens as a shelter for our most vulnerable neighbors. The HVAC systems here were specifically designed to support this use with air conditioning upgrades and air filtration systems that can help support extreme smoke uh, events. And the next slide, please. Thank you. Our project funding comes from multiple sources. Uh, in 2018, we were awarded one, 15 million from Mayor Wheeler's Build Portland Initiative to address part of the maintenance backlog at Mount Scott Community Center and to also address important structural concerns, seismic upgrades and roof re renovations. The Build Portland funds are leveraged by 12.1 million in system development charge funds to support the expansion of the community center and a total of 245,700 major maintenance general funds to facilitate ADA improvements. The Mayor's Livability Emergency Coordination Fund provides an additional seven million to this project. And last in 2017, we had 80,118 in, in funding um, allocated as part of the capital set aside project. The overall total project budget is 34.5 million. And our next slide, please. So when this project began, alternative contracting methods were uh, not the norm for the city, and a decision was made to develop a project with a traditional design bid build approach. As a result, this project will be bid as a standard low bid contract. Staff are working with our colleagues in uh, procurement services to ensure that COVID certified firms are aware of the project well ahead of the bidding process. Um, outreach will include detailed presentations to the National Association of Minority Contractors, Latino Built, and others. 
Our desire is to provide detailed project information to these firms and bolster their opportunity to successfully bid on this project and become part of this remarkable improvement for the community. We do plan to return to Council with uh, procurement services to share our COVID participation rates of the successful bidder and answer any questions you may have at that time. So with that, we'd like to request um, authorization for a competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder for construction of the Mount Scott Community Center seismic retrofit and expansion project for an estimated cost of $28,300,000. With acceptance of this authority to bid, um, we will proceed with bid advertisement as soon as possible. And in partnership with procurement services, we'll target exceeding our standard subcontractor equity program specification requirements of 20% of the hard bid. We anticipate construction to start in uh, late fall, early winter of 2023, with a completion date by uh, 2000, oh, 2025. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Maps. Um, thank you. I want to, um, I really appreciate the presentation. This looks like a great project. Um, I think my question may actually be for Commissioner Ryan. Um, you know, later on today, I believe this council will vote on a proposal to cap uh, system development charges, um, including system development charges to parks. I see that there are about $12 million in SDCs baked into this particular project. Um, I don't know if it's a staff question or a commissioner question. Have we invest investigated what impact um, the budget cuts that are on the table for later on today might have on this particular project? Can we afford to do that if we cap S Can we afford to do this if we cap SDCs? Uh, great question. I wish I could have a warning so I could answer it better. No, I just thought of it. That's okay. okay. I do it all the time, too. It's called a meeting, so yeah. it's good. Um, do you have any uh, updates for the commissioner, or should we loop back to him on the, on I, the I think we'll now? need to loop back uh, to, you that, to you on that, Commissioner Maps, uh, for a firm answer. My understanding is that the SDCs have already been dedicated. Yeah, because it's going and that forward. Our SDC yeah. managers would be able to... Uh, see how any changes might impact future projects. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So if you send that email to me and to Matt, we'll, thanks. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, just two questions. First one, hopefully just the 30 second version, but when we're looking at parks and capital projects of this size, could you give me the high level on the, how we prioritize projects, how we weigh them, um, given, you know, just overall capital plan, how do mm -hmm. we, uh, what's the short version of how we prioritize, prioritize projects? Great, thank you, good question. Uh, 30 seconds, it's, uh, we work, we first, we start off with our, uh, our staff that are in the, in the facilities on the regular and, how, and assess our, what, what facilities need it most. We also have an equity lens that we look through uh, as part of the equation, which parts of the community are not being served, which parts of the community have not been served in the past. How do we prioritize those facilities for our community? That's a, it's a really big part of how we prioritize what should happen next. Got it. And yeah. partially to build off of Commissioner Maps' uh, question, um, as best we can project the impact of capping system development charges on future uh, ability to do these type of projects would be uh, helpful for this afternoon. So uh, just yeah. bootstrapping off of where he was going, but would like to understand it. Thank you. Absolutely. And I'm glad you asked that question. I thought your report did answer that as well. And I have to say just how busy it was. It's such in a high impact area. Mm -hmm. And it's clear just by looking at the roof, it needs to be fixed ASAP. Yeah, I think you picked the right project. I want us to continue to think about um, what we will do when it's temporarily shut down while we do that. So I think that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest challenges when Parks um, mm -hmm. takes on these endeavors is how we work with the community so that the nearby facilities can take that backlog and how we can help with transportation and such. So I just wanted to put that out there and also to remind Parks that that's on the top of my mind when we look at this uh, shutdown because it's so popular, it was packed there. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Rubio. I just want to say thank you, I'm Robert. I'm sorry. Did I, I pass Commissioner Gonzalez? I'm done. Sorry. You're done. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Rubio. I just want to say thank you, Robin. It's um, uh, it's great to see you, but also um, just, you know, this project has been a long time coming in development and um, very excited for the community. I know they've been waiting for this. Um, and also just this is, uh, remind me, but this is also a site that, that the 
the broader community and inter interjurisdictionally we have um, has relied upon for like a warming center. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and so um, it's actually timely. And and can you tell me a little bit about um, is that going to continue or what's the what's the plan there? Yeah, that will continue. Uh, our I, I don't run the center, so I'd have to confer with Adam for sure. Uh, but my understanding is that those support services would continue after the renovation. We've specifically upgraded the um, heating, ventilation, and cooling systems to be able to better respond to higher temperatures and, again, uh, smoke events. Right. It lifted yeah. up those, those concerns around HVAC right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Do we have public testimony on this item? No one signed up. All right, very good. Anything else on this before I move it? This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Great presentation, phenomenal uh, photos. And uh, it moves second reading. Thank you. Thank good you. work. Terrific work. Next item, please. Item number, do, do people want to take a five minute break? We've got a couple, why don't we do that? Let's, let's take a five minute recess. Uh, we are Recording stopped. Thank you. 
Recording in progress.
question. Can we please go to item number 390? This is an emergency ordinance. Amend price agreement with Infor Public Sector Incorporated for the Infor Public Sector Water Asset, Asset Management System Replacement Project to extend term an additional five years for $9,163,708. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Water Bureau and the Bureau of Environmental Services. Those bureaus seek to amend a price agreement for asset management software. Now, here's some background on this ordinance. Environmental Services and the Water Bureau manage $39 billion in city assets. And when I uh, uh, hit the B there, there's a point, 39 billion. These are, uh, um, this, that's an awful lot. Both bureaus use in for public sector software to manage those assets. Today, the city's utility bureaus seek to amend the price agreement we have with in for public sector software. Uh, this amendment would extend the price agreement through May 30th, 2029 and would add a little more than $9 million to this contract. Uh, this increase in funds would bring the total price agreement amount to a little more than $10 million. Here to tell us uh, more about this ordinance, we have Gabe Salmer, uh, Portland Water Bureau's uh, director, and we have Devin Sanders, the Water Bureau's acting technology manager, and in addition to that, we have some staff from environmental services, including Baron Howe, um, information service, information systems manager, and Mia Sabanovic, uh, who is the interim division manager in operations and maintenance. And with that, I will turn the uh, platform and presentation over to our invited guest. Thank you so much, Commissioner, Mayor, members of City Council. Good morning, I think we're just under the wire for that. Um, I am director of your Portland Water Bureau, Gabe Salmer, and I'm joined today, uh, as the commissioner mentioned, by Devin Sanders of the Water Bureau, and then Baron Howe and Mia Spanovich of the Bureau of Environmental Services. You'll probably hear that a lot, um, these two bureaus joining together. Um, we can pull up the slide, looks great, and we can move on to the next, uh, I, uh, next slide. Um, so this is an emergency ordinance before the council. It will authorize the chief procurement officer to authorize the use of funds from BES and the Water Bureau to amend a service contract with INFOR to implement a work and asset management system. We often refer to that as WAMS. Uh, this is a five-year agreement and it includes both bureau's service contract costs and sets a not to exceed amount of just over $9.1 million for the five-year period. The cost has been included in the budgets of each bureau. I think that's important to mention. And I'll just say that it is an emergency ordinance action because uh, the Oracle Work and Asset Management System, uh, or OWAM, that both bureaus use right now has been out of support since August of 2021. And the system has known information security vulnerabilities. It clearly won't go into what those are, uh, but you, uh, we'll see the need for us to move uh, with all haste here. Uh, I'll hand the presentation off now to Devin Sanders uh, to cover a little bit more about our asset management systems. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council members. Um, it's useful at this point to offer, oh, and next slide, please. Could, could I interrupt for one second? Certainly. So um, just when you think nobody famous is going to show up, in walks County Commissioner-Elect Julia Brim Edwards. Congratulations. <laughs> thanks, thanks for being here. And uh, we're really excited for you. Thanks, first of all, for running. You bring a lot of experience. And we appreciate all the nice things you said during your campaign about working with the City Council. We, we heard that. and. Uh, we want to reciprocate that. We see lots of great opportunities to work with you and your colleagues at the county. And the fact that today on your very first day post-election, you've chosen to come here. Well, thanks for being here. Somebody has comments for me too. There you go. <laughs> right. Tell us about water and Yeah. Um, Thank you so much, um, Mayor Wheeler and members of the um, council. I'm super excited to be here and I was actually just going to drop in and I didn't know you were in. Um, 
meeting today, but I was going to drop we're, we're in. We're always in meetings. Uh, <laughs> That's what we do. I know, you're just hard at work. Um, but I wanted to stop in and as one of my first things after being elected to um, tell all of you individually, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to tell you all collectively, I'm really looking forward to working closely with the city. Um, I think we're going to solve our problems and the big challenges we face as a community um, working together. And I pledge uh, my partnership and I'm really looking forward to um, getting getting in there and uh, taking effective action together uh, for our community because I know we all sh share uh, the same love for uh, this city and community and um, I'm really looking forward to working with you. Um, I'm not going to be sworn in until June 8th, but I'm oh. ready to go to work and I really appreciate all of your services and um, I'm looking forward to the partnership. Great. Thank, thank you for being here and colleagues. I don't know if anybody wanted to just extend the uh, uh, welcome. To. I, I certainly would, and, I, and I'm certain my colleagues uh, would too. I just want to congratulate the commissioner elect on her electoral victory, and I want to thank you for stopping by today uh, um, to visit and uh, reaffirm the need for the city and the county to work together. Uh, um, you have demonstrated that with both your words and actions. I also want to pledge my commitment to work with you and the county to do everything that we can to make sure that we serve the people of Portland and Multnomah County um, more effectively effectively than we are today. Um, I also want to um, um, encourage you to take a vacation uh, uh, between now and your uh, um, swearing in time. I got that advice when I was in a similar moment to you. I don't think I ever got around to exercising that, uh, um, which was a mistake because this is probably the last chance you will get for a long time to um, go sit on a Unfortunately, beach. I still have, uh, not unfortunately, but I have the school district budget uh, uh, yeah, to, so to adopt it, over the next uh, two weeks. Which, well, it's... But I am going to take tonight off. Try to get, yeah, exactly. Just at some point, just getting sleep is, uh, um, well, is all you can do. So I, I hope that you are sleeping well. Thank you so much for your service. And uh, thank you for stopping by today. Thank you. Yes, uh, Commissioner-elect, so good to see you. Uh, we go back a ways because of the fact that we, um, well, I'm an alum of the Portland Public School Board. And you've been on that school board for some time in and out. Even when you weren't on the board when I was on it, it felt like you are because you're just so engaged. And Commissioner Maps, I hope Julia takes the vacation as well, but I can tell you this. I can't tell you how many times I've done texting with you while you're on vacation. So um, yeah, do the vacation so maybe your workload will go down just a little bit while you're away. But thank you for jumping in the race. Um, the overlap is obviously a big deal. I know coming from the school's background, you'll be such an easy fit for the county because it's so much of the wraparound services for evenings and weekends and summers come through the county. And then I just really appreciate the dialogue we've had of late about the connection between schools and parks. And so you're just gonna be a great partner. It's and also a fellow PIL um, alum from late 70s. Um, anyway, here we are in local politics. I think the mayor could say that as well. We got well, Washington Monroe, right? Or was it just Washington? Roosevelt. It was Roosevelt. Washington I'm Monroe. Roosevelt. You're Washington Monroe. That's Lincoln. Yeah. So. Anyway, it's great to have hometown love here in the council. Yeah. Um, I just want to say congratulations, um, Commissioner-elect, and we've known each other a long time over the years in our work in education, and I know you'll bring that same thoughtful care uh, that you do to education to the broader community, and um, just we look forward to partnering you with you in the future. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I went in on this a little bit too. Look forward to working with you. We've got some serious problems in the city and county, but uh, a lot of opportunity too. So look forward to working with you. Great. We're going to do it together and we're going to make this community better. So Absolutely. thank you again for letting me stop thank by you. and I really look forward to working with all Thanks of you. Thanks for dropping. Thank you, sorry to interrupt your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so at this point, what we'd like to do is offer a brief glimpse into what an asset management system is. Um, an asset management system is comprised of the processes, tools, and technology used to manage a wide variety of assets, all the way from the simplicity of a valve, <clears throat> excuse me, to the complexity of an entire treatment plant. Asset management systems support the management of assets and all related operations and maintenance work throughout the life cycle of the asset from design to decommissioning. And at the city, we have a wide variety of asset management systems 
from world-class processes to paper and pencil. But I'll wrap this up with a simple analogy. As SAP is critical to running city business operations, an asset management system is critical to running utility operations. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> now, collectively, BES and the Water Bureau manage, uh, manage and maintain assets valued at over $39 billion. These comprise the city's water, wastewater, stormwater, and natural systems. And currently, these assets are managed by a rich mix of legacy technology layered across multiple <coughs> systems and work processes. BES and PWB faced an August 2021 end of support for one of the major asset management system software currently in use by both bureaus. For the last several years, the bureaus have been working in partnership to assess the marketplace for utility asset management systems that would meet the bureau's needs. An RFI process was conducted in 2019 to solicit responses to the combined bureau requirements for utility asset management system. And following the RFI process, both bureaus aligned on the selection of a single vendor and system for managing assets called N4 Public Sector. BES has successfully used N4 products for aspects of asset management for over a decade. I'll now hand the presentation off to Mia Sabanovich, the Interim Operations and Maintenance Division Manager at BES to cover more key drivers for this work. Thanks, Devin, and thanks uh, the Council for your time today. My name is Mia Sabanovich. I use her, she pronouns. Um, while the ordinance before the council today is a simple one to authorize the use of a contract to purchase implementation service, I want to highlight the unique and strategic opportunities that a future asset management system represents for BES and PWB. Both bureaus recognize the opportunity to align and continue to support city core values of anti-racism, equity, transparency, communication, collaboration, and fiscal responsibility. As has been described, this will be the first time that both bureaus have leveraged the same system allowing for increase in transparency, communication, collaboration, asset useful life cost optimization across both bureaus. While we consider the BES and PWB managing over 39 billions in assets and spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year on asset operation, maintenance, and capital investment projects, it is a super exciting opportunity to focus not just on stable and functioning asset management systems, but also in supporting each bureau's anti-racism and equity work. Imagine the cross-bureau opportunity that this generates and the partnership internally and externally with historically underrepresented communities. Today, actions before the council to approve acquisition of implementation services is the next step in, the ex in this exciting process, in this exciting journey. In addition to these future benefits to date, we have realized opportunities to act equitably. We have worked with local MWESB certified firms for professional services, such as project management, such as uh, QAQC work. Uh, there may also be additional opportunities for more certified firms, such as project management, and also organizational change manager agents. I will now handle the presentation over to Baron Howe, our technology manager for Bureau of Environmental Services, to cover the phases of this work. Great. Thank you so much, Mia. <clears throat> Hello, Mayor and members of City Council. Um, if we could advance this slide, please. Uh, one more, actually. There we go. Thank you. So in this section, I'll briefly explain the approach to this project, uh, where we've been, what comes after today's ordinance uh, to procure implementation services. So in 2019, both bureaus collaborated and coordinated to evaluate and select the software in for public sector through an RFI and then a cooperative agreement process. Uh, that culminated in Ordinance 190315, uh, a software as a service contract. At that time, we informed council that we had that we planned to be back, knowing we'd be required to increase our existing Infor Services contract ceiling once we solidified our requirements, developed a scope, and could provide a higher confidence cost estimate. 
So from 2020 to um, late last year, 2022, using remaining funds on the existing services contract, we completed what is termed the engage scoping phase, where planning workshops with Infor were held with several bureau subject matter experts to determine the overall system requirements across both bureaus. These workshops resulted in cost estimates, scope and schedule for the implementation phase of this work. Today, as promised, we are back to get your authorization to proceed with amending the city's existing Infor services contract to begin that implementation phase for both bureaus. Uh, in addition, we're planning for engagement and oversight from the, uh, from the Technology Oversight Committee and have secured a third-party QAQC uh, firm to monitor the project along the way. Uh, and lastly, following implementation, both bureaus will transition to ongoing operations and what we've termed the evolve phase, where we'll govern and continuously evaluate and, and improve to include new features and or functions to support existing uh, and or new business flows to meet the asset management and maintenance needs of the bureaus. Thanks, Baron. And we can move to the final slide. So really, that concludes our presentation. We're available for any questions that the council might have. Commissioner Maps. Um, I want to thank everyone for the presentation today, and I want to thank you for this uh, very important project. We're kind of tight on time today, so instead of posing questions to elicit information, um, I think I want to just turn directly to my colleagues and share um, some thoughts I have about this particular ordinance um, and this particular project. It's it's very exciting, and I think there's some lessons uh, to be learned here. Uh, first, as we've talked about many times uh, since we've been on this council, this city needs to do a better job at asset management. We have two bureaus in the city that kind of do it best, um, and this is an example of bureaus really stepping up and being on the cutting edge of asset management. Second thing that's really exciting about this, we have two different bureaus using the same asset management system. Uh, one of the things that comes out of that is I think it will become much easier for water and environmental services to uh, um, work together to trade information. This makes a lot of sense since literally our pipes are kind of a circle at some level. Uh, uh, um, so that is huge. And the fact that they can trade information so efficiently um, creates opportunities for um, other efficiencies. Um, here's a good example. Um, I think I've talked to almost everyone on this council about how a couple of weeks ago I did a um, uh, water bureau permit uh, ride along. So I went down to the folks, hung out, spent an afternoon or a morning hanging out with the folks of the water bureau who do, uh, who issue permits. And you probably have talked, to, you heard me talk about the fact that uh, the people who issue our water bureau permits literally have to deal with 21 different uh, pieces of software to do that work. And I think one of the reasons why there's so many different bits of software involved is that we're dealing with files that come from different bureaus. So the housing bureau or even the water and sewer might have different files. And so sometimes you're literally using a program just to convert a program so that you can read it and whatnot. Um, all of that kind of friction I hope uh, I, I goes away and becomes much simpler. So I would point out, and this is a hypothesis, frankly, I haven't fully um, unpacked it with the folks who are experts in this field. I think if we wanted to get better at permitting, uh, um, one of the things that we should really uh, focus on and explore is to try to get as many of our bureaus as possible on the right, on similar or at least uh, asset management software systems that can talk to each other. I think that would take away a lot of the friction that we see, would make us much better in this space. Um, and the, uh, um, so that's very exciting. Uh, um, I'll tell you, I'm glad to have these two uh, bureaus uh, um, using the same software. One of the discussions I'll be having with Peabot is to see if this is a good fit for him, for them too. I don't know, you know, managing pipes is different from managing roads. And I'm not an expert in this field, but if there are opportunities like that, uh, certainly one of the lessons I've learned in recent months and one of the lessons I carry forward in the future. Um, and the last uh, opportunity uh, that I think is really um, important here is we're all sitting here, uh, um, in a, we're in other meetings thinking about uh, reorganizing and reimagining government, how we cluster bureaus and whatnot. You know, it is, as I think about appropriate bureau, bureau clusters, actually clustering bureaus that could use the same asset management software um, 
makes a certain sort of sense. I don't know if that's the only consideration I would have in terms of which bureaus I cluster together, but there, in, in terms of just being a high level manager, which we kind of are, and certainly our future city managers are, uh, actually having asset management software kind of define what's underneath your tent, I think makes a lot of sense. And I hope that we uh, consider these possibilities as we move forward into the future. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, I'm going to keep it quick. This is is this this is SaaS then is, is the license model. Okay, and um, everything is going to be stored in the cloud. Uh, reputable vendor, yes. uh, long track record in government contracts. Um, I just want to bootstrap a little bit off of Commissioner Mapp's points about the possibility of this being an example for the rest of the city. Can we consolidate fixed assets? Uh, in a lot of our other systems across bureaus where it makes sense. Um, you know, SAP has a certain function when we talk about payroll, but it's just, I think long-term it will drive uh, utilization and I think it's gonna lead to efficiency. So glad to support the project, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Do we have public testimony on this item? No one signed This is an emergency ordinance, please call the roll. Ryan. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. <clears throat> and it really is a significant step towards addressing the limitations of the current system and improving workforce and asset management in the public sector. And who doesn't love the partnership between the cousins of um, the bureaus of environmental services and water? Um, anyway, this is a great uh, journey that you're on. And this is a pretty easy common sense vote. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I want to thank staff for the presentation uh, today and the work that you've done to get us to this point. Uh, I think this is a very exciting and very important moment in the city, uh, which is why I am glad to vote aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Thank you. Great presentation. The ordinance is adopted. Thanks, Commissioner Maps. Sure. Next time, 391. This is a first reading of a non emergency ordinance. Authorize intergovernmental agreement with Multnomah County Health Department for $129,000 to conduct lead-related public health services for the Lead Hazard Reduction Program. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Water Bureau. The Bureau seeks to enter into an IGA with Multnomah County's Health Department for $129,000 to conduct lead-related public health services. Here is some background on this ordinance. For more than 20 years, the City of Portland's Water Bureau has partnered with Multnomah County's Health Department to provide lead poison prevention services to our community. Uh, the ordinance before us today would authorize the Water Bureau to continue to support uh, the county's lead-related public health services for one additional year. Um, here today to tell us more about this ordinance, we have Bra uh, Scott Bradway, a Water Quality Information Program officer. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, Mayor. Um, Scott Bradway, he, him, Water Quality Information Program Manager with the Portland Water Bureau. Um, as Commissioner Maps mentioned, um, the Water Bureau is seeking approval to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the Multnomah County Health Department in the amount of $129,000 for lead-related public health services to our community. Uh, we've been partnering with the Multnomah County Health Department for over 20 years. This partnership has been part of our lead hazard reduction program, which has served as our compliance with the lead and copper rule. Um, this compliance program has included education and outreach, um, lead and water education and testing, home lead hazard mitigation, and partial corrosion control treatment. In April of 2022, Portland Water Bureau brought on improved corrosion control treatment. With this new treatment online, we are currently transitioning our compliance approach with the lead and copper rule from our lead hazard reduction program to full corrosion control treatment going forward. As we make this transition, we seek to maintain this partnership with the Multnomah County Health Department to continue to provide public health um, support and continue monitoring of sources of exposure to lead in the Portland region. Um, this, this funding will last for an additional fiscal year, um, and the funding will, will support Multnomah County Health Department in their public information and referrals through their um, lead line program. Um, they will also continue to um, do intake of the free lead and water test kit program that the Portland Water Bureau manages. And most importantly, they will um, be managing um, elevated blood lead level investigation and case management for the community. And with that, um, open it up to any questions. Commissioner Gonzalez. I'm sorry, that's legacy. All good. I'll take my hand. Right. Uh, do we have public testimony on this item? 
We do. We have three people signed up. All right, let's hear them. Uh, first up, we have Kimberly Goheen Albon online. Thanks. Yes, this is Kimberly Goheen Albon, clerk, uh, citizen for life here. Um, so I was there speaking last week. I actually have uh, an email that said that I could have spoken on the uh, uh, time certain 381 when asked if there were anybody was there. I was w sitting there waiting. Um, I did not get to, so can I have those three minutes and then the three minutes on this agenda? You, you have three minutes for public testimony. All right. Uh, I, I would like to let the citizens know of Portland that, in, in my understanding, this is the way that a Marxist uh, local government will act uh, against citizens like myself who speak up. Um, you are United Nations members of the ICLEI. Therefore, I'll speak on all of the agendas in short as I look at my notes. Um, it was a very informative um, meeting today. I'm all for the watershed programs other than the inside hardware uh, earned tax dollars passed around between government, government officials. Um, so yes to these programs, but while the climate action plan was mentioned, I'll say this, your membership to the United Nations ICLEI, which does not follow the United States Constitution, um, uh, must stop you. I'll ask you to get out of that membership. That's why all the chaos, everything follows under this, their twofold agenda, which is to uh, use local governments to um, weaken America by following their agenda, not the Constitution of which the voters believe you are, and then to depopulate. And that's going to be the nightmare that we wake up to. Citizens in Clark County are already waking up to um, vaccine injured injuries. So this is um, a big, deep thing that people, it's going to be a nightmare for them. Um, in short, uh, also, for God's sake, our police are our protectors. But how can they do the right thing under the law when the system is corrupt enough to back the criminals? This is uh, really deep. Uh, and to the citizens can listen to Radio FM 101.1 .1 FM daily. Um, a lot of the budget is funded by Criminal Biden's America Rescrew Plan using uh, fake climate uh, change fears and the uh, pandemic of which we believe this COVID uh, was a pandemic to divide people. And uh, they did a damn good job. We will never shut down again. We will never mask up again. I believe that it was a divisive way that you people do and must understand this. Please, I'm, I'm asking that heart that was created, a spirit that you look at this agenda and you and the answer comes every time that it's not, what's wrong with it? It's not following the constitution that our godly forefathers made for us. It stood 200 years. We're gonna keep it standing. We are not going to have the one world order. You will not weaken America. The citizens of Portland must understand Thank that you. Uh, you are governed by a United please. Nations. Thank you. Next individual, please. Next up, we have D. White. Hi, Dee. Thanks for being here. My name is Dee White. Um, wait a minute. If you want to go. The first recital on this contract is false. The Water Bureau is on the record for ending in 2022 their misdirected lead reduction program for compliance with the lead and copper rule. For them to say they are transitioning their way of complying with the federal law is not legitimate. This contract does not extend this now illegitimate compliance program. This contract is solely a vehicle whereby ratepayer funds are being used to pay the salaries for a program run by Multnomah County. This contract should not be approved. It is another example of the Water Bureau inappropriately spending ratepayer money, in this case for personnel in the Multnomah County Health Department. This personnel expense should be borne by Multnomah County and their tax revenue, not via our water bill. This contract is only for personnel costs. There are no material costs, there are no deliverables. The majority, $85,500 of this contract is going to 1.5 FTE lead specialist position at the health department. 
According to this contract, the one and only task performed by this employee at the health department that is related to water is, quote, collecting requests for lead and water test kits and sending the list of requests to the city on a weekly basis, end quote. The remaining tasks on this contract are not related to water, but ratepayers will be paying for them anyway, and this is illegal. The court has ordered that the spending of ratepayer dollars must be related to providing clean, safe water to Portland water users. Thus, the vast majority of this contract cost is illegitimate spending of ratepayer money. Meanwhile, the Water Bureau's $20 million treatment facility that was opened and began operation last year has failed at significantly reducing the lead in Portland's water. Do not think, commissioners, for one second that this facility is anything other than a complete waste of ratepayer money. Portland Water Bureau continues to fail at protecting the public's health with their continued unsafe lead levels in our drinking water. But to loop back, this contract should not be approved. Ratepayer money should not be used to pay the county personnel performing tasks not related to water. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Portland Advocates for Lead-Free Drinking Water. Yeah, are you able to unmute? To look back, this contract should not. I can kind can of you, hear somebody. Can you hear us? Oh. Yeah, that sounded like G's voice replayed. Oh, go ahead. It looks like you're unmuted. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can. Yes. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. And I wanted to say we are so grateful to the many independent experts willing to answer questions that our own Water Bureau has not. Uh, we think uh, you, commissioners, and the public deserve better information about this Multnomah County Health position, which PWB is requesting to fund for $129,000. This ordinance is primarily for one point five FTE specialist position at the county's lead line. And here's why. When we ask the lead line specialist for lead and water data in the lead poisoning homes that he investigates, he said this. The quote, the short answer is that a document like you described doesn't exist. Only a fraction of the lead poisoning cases over the last five years will have lead and water test results, unquote. Leadline instead primarily focuses on lead paint per Portland Water Bureau's lead hazard reduction program. But as researchers and scientists know, lead in drinking water is different from lead from other sources since it disproportionately affects developmentally vulnerable children and pregnant mothers. In fact, tap water can account for more than 85% of total lead exposure among infants consuming reconstituted formula. Even so, the lead line specialist rarely, if at all, tests the tap water in his lead poisoning cases. Instead, he collects requests for a DIY lead and water kit. You won't find lead and water if you don't test, and this lead, special, this lead specialist doesn't. Further, he doesn't believe tap water here is a problem, despite the news articles, congressional testimony, data, and the utility's own recent and previous lead and water exceedances. Secondly, perhaps equally important to call out here are the faulty water test kits themselves that the PW, PWB aggressively promotes and sends to customers and leadline clients. As the director knows, these old science kits don't follow EPA protocol for vulnerable populations. To be clear, these kits can grossly underrepresent and may even miss lead coming out of taps. And finally, a third critical error. The Portland Water Director and City Attorney wrote, quote, lead poisoning prevention into this agreement six times. Yet, if Portland Water Borough were engaging in lead prevention, they would be testing every one of these homes using science 
and sound water testing protocol. Critically, they would be handing out certified lead reducing water filters as the first default response. Commissioners, if you read the exhibits, that's not going to happen and never has. Lead line and PWB's LHRP has not prevented lead and water exposure and poisonings as lead, as independent experts have pointed out. We urge you to reject Portland Water's ask for $129,000 today as records show lead line and PWB downplaying an important source of lead exposure water. To be perfectly blunt, Portland Water is paying the lead line to look the other way. PWB should be using water funding to mitigate lead and water, not to mitigate lead paint. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. That completes testimony. Very good. Colleagues, any further discussion before I move this? This is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Next item, 392, please. Authorize the regulated ordinance. affordable multifamily assistance program pilot to provide utility bill discounts to multifamily properties approved for the nonprofit low income housing limited tax exemption program. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, colleagues, uh, this is a great program. Um, I've come and spoken with you about it many times mm -hmm. over the past few months, if not the past few years. This particular initiative would allow uh, the Water Bureau and BES to uh, pr provide uh, assistance to low-income Portlanders who live in apartments. Um, I'll tell you, there's a challenge to providing utility assistance to people who live in apartments, and that makes sense if you think about the way in which uh, water meters are set up. Um, this is a huge equity move. This is something I'm, I'm really proud of my uh, staff and the, f and the folks over at the Water Bureau for figuring out. Um, however, today I find myself in the very sad situation of needing to pull this back to my office. Uh, and I need to pull it back to my office because later on in this afternoon we will consider a series of cuts to uh, the utility bureaus. Um, and uh, should those cuts pass, I will not be able to afford to um, offer uh, rate breaks to low-income Portlanders who live in apartments. So um, until we get greater clarity on uh, what resources are available to the water and sewers, uh, this project um, remains in my, on my desk. So I'm pulling it. Without objection. 393, please, an emergency ordinance. Authorize new construction financing for an affordable housing project located at 1131 Southeast Oak Street to be developed by Francis Clare Place Limited Partnership or a Catholic Charities of Oregon affiliate not to exceed $9,421,891. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. I'm pleased to be bringing forward Francis and Clare Place, a project by Catholic Charities of Oregon for a new permanent supportive housing development in inner Southeast Portland using Portland housing bond funds. The proposed city funding leverages over 18 million of other public and private financing and delivers 61 units of affordable housing, all targeted to serve households impacted by homelessness. The project is in a centrally located area close to numerous amenities, including public transit, health clinics, grocery stores, and recreational activities or opp opportunities in a location where affordable housing is scarce. I wanna thank the Archdiocese of Portland St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church, Catholic Charities, and its development partner, Edlin and Company, for deli delivering much needed affordable housing and culturally responsive support services in partnership with the City of Portland and stakeholders. So I'd now like to pass it to PHB's Interim Director, Molly Rogers, to share more about this great project. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. And, um, Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, I am Molly Rogers. I'm the Interim Director of the Portland Housing Bureau. With me today is Jill Chen, PHB's Housing Investments and Portfolio Preservation Manager, who will co-present with me today, as well as the Francis and Claire team. Next slide. We are pleased to provide a summary of the Portland Housing Bureau's progress and on implementing the city's goals for the Portland Housing Bond. As a reminder, all bond funds have been allocated toward the creation of 1,859 new affordable homes, exceeding our commitment of 1,300 units to Portlanders by 43% to house over 4,000 people. 900 units are open and Almost 1,000 are under construction or in pre-development. 
Notably, 399 units will house some of our community's most vulnerable households experiencing homelessness, like the future residents of Francis and Claire Place. Next slide. Today, we are seeking approvals to fund the Francis and Claire Place. It is a multifamily affordable rental project with 61 rent regulated units. It is located at 1131 Southeast Oak Street in the Buckman neighborhood. And I'd like to express my deep appreciation for the Archdiocese of Portland, St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church, Catholic Charities, and its development partner, Edelin and Company, for bringing this project forward. And in particular, we appreciate the willingness of the church to sell a portion of their land to facilitate the development and welcoming the residents into this community. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jill Chen. Next slide. Thank you, Molly. And for the record, I am Jill Chen, Portland Housing Bureau's Housing Investments and Portfolio Preservation Manager and use she, her pronouns. As Commissioner Rubio already mentioned, this project will be 100% permanent supportive housing targeted for individuals and couples exiting chronic homelessness with rental assistance and supportive services. The borrower will enter into regulatory agreements with PHB in accordance with city policies to maintain the affordability for 99 years. Next slide, please. The project is comprised of 54 studios and seven one bedroom units, consistent with the needs of this household size and designed for this population. All units will be affordable to households earning up to 30% of area median income, with many expected to have no income at all. All unit rents will be supported by project-based Section 8 vouchers. Next slide, please. Amenities include a quiet room, flexible classroom community space with kitchen, offices for delivery of resident services and supportive services, laundry rooms, bike storage, and a 24 seven front desk coverage. Residents will have access to Francis and Claire Commons, a pedestrian green street adjacent to this building. The project is on track to earn Earth Advantage multifamily gold certification, Features include low flow fixtures, energy star appliances and lighting and durable sustainable materials. Francis and Claire Place is designed as solar ready and anticipates solar panel installation through the partnership between PHB and the Portland Clean Energy Fund. The project expects to meet or exceed PHB's equity and contracting goals of 30% disadvantaged minority women emerging small business firm utilization for hard cost and 20% utilization for professional services. Current projections are for 30% hard cost and up to 86% for soft cost. Construction will start next month, June, 2023, and is expected to be completed by spring of 2024. Next slide, please. The 61 households will have wraparound services provided by Catholic Charities and Native American Rehabilitation Association, or NARA. Funding for these supportive services is provided by the Joint Office of Homeless Services, totaling up to 10,000 per unit per year. All units, as mentioned, will have rental support from project-based Section 8 vouchers awarded by Home Forward. Next slide, please. Catholic Charities in partnership with NARA of Northwest will provide both resident and supportive services in a culturally appropriate manner. Services will be focused on housing stability and retention, including case management, peer support, resource navigation, including assessing of benefits and community building activities. Next slide, please. The proposed city funding of approximately 9.4 million is leveraged almost two times 
raising over 18 million in other public and private funding. Our, our funding partners include Enterprise Community Partners, Heritage Bank, Oregon Housing and Community Services, and Metro for a Grant. Other city resources consist of system development charge exemption, and as mentioned, Portland Clean Energy Fund. Next slide, please. In conclusion, we are asking city council to authorize funding of up to 9 million four hundred twenty-one thousand eight hundred ninety-one dollars to Francis and Claire Place Limited Partnership or an affiliate of Catholic Charities of Oregon and to authorize the interim director of PHB to approve amendments and execute any related documentation necessary to advance the project within the maximum approved amounts. Finally, I want to introduce our development partners, Keyshawn Coleman, Vice President of Community Development and Housing at Catholic Charities, and Jill Sherman, partner of Eaglin and Company, uh, who will have some brief comments and are available for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, Molly. Um, my name is Keyshawn Coleman. As Jill said, I am the Vice President of Community Development and Housing here at Catholic Charities of Oregon. Um, I have been here since December of 2022 when I was first introduced to the project. To provide some background on our organization, Caritas Housing is an entity under Catholic Charity of Oregon that takes pride in serving the most vulnerable Oregonians. Francis and Claire is a great example of how CCO can work together with a vast support system to provide housing to those that would not have had it without our support. In this case, those who are at risk of homelessness homelessness, excuse me, are currently experiencing homelessness. Some of the great teammates and supporters that have contributed to the success of this project have been OHCS and Home Forward, the joint office with their coordinated access system, as well as uh, permanent supportive housing funds for our wraparound service. Enterprise is our limited partner and NARA um, to provide culturally specific trauma informed resident services and peer support alongside our services team. Our services team at Catholic Charities of Oregon will provide oversight of on-site staffing, ensure tenants are connected with case management to remain housed, provide linkage to mental health and addiction services, domestic violence survivor supports, and help applying for benefits and employ employment services as needed. Additionally, I would like to provide a big thanks to the Archdiocese of Portland, as well as the St. Francis Parish for providing us with amenity-rich land next to another project that we currently own, St. Francis Park. Finally, I'd like to provide a huge thanks to the Portland Housing Bureau, who has supported us in the community to meet the, the needs of houselessness and housing insecurity, which has historically had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Through the last five months of my experience of working with the Housing Bureau, I can truly say that PHB will do anything that they can to provide housing to those who need it most. Last but not least, before I before I hand the presentation over to Jill Sherman, I'd like to provide a big thanks to her and her team for their tremendous support over the last few years on the project, and like other entities that I have named, their desire to provide housing to those who need it most. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Jill Sherman. Uh, thanks, Kishan, and good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and uh, City Council members. Um, I am Jill Sherman, I am a partner with Edlin & Co, and we are a local developer that works on affordable and middle-income housing, community facilities, and projects that push the boundaries of sustainability. And we have had the privilege of working with Catholic Charities on this project um, over the last couple of years. Um, projects like this, I think, really are part of the solution toward addressing some of the challenges that our city faces and that um, you know you as the council and others have been working so hard on over the last few years. This project, as everyone has explained, does reach some of the neediest populations in our community, folks who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. And these projects do not happen without local gap funding for affordable housing. And in this case, that was provided by the Portland Housing Bond. And so I think it's important to recognize the citizens for for passing this bond and then the Housing Bureau for deploying um, all of these funds to achieve those goals that were originally set out. Um, the project also leverages, uh, as folks have said, a significant amount of other 
other sources, including over $11 million in federal tax credits, which is essentially some an investment that we're bringing into, into our city. Um, I would echo uh, what Keyshawn said about uh, the Housing Bureau's partnership, as well as the Bureau of Development Services. Um, this uh, project has some complexities around the site in particular and how we fit this project in with other things that are already happening on the site. And we had some complex issues that we were able to work on together in multiple meetings um, to come out with good solutions with everybody coming to the table with really that type of mentality that we are working together towards solutions. Um, other financial partners, Oregon Housing and Community Service, the Joint Office, and Home Forward, Metro, and then of course PHB and PSEF are all critical pieces of this, of this puzzle. Finally, our architect, Holst Architecture, who um, I think has put together another um, quality and contextual design, and then O'Neill Walsh Community Builders, our general contractor who's been with us um, from the beginning, providing important feedback on budgeting and constructability. Um, our bids are in, so we are close to finalizing our guaranteed maximum price, and I'm happy to report that we will uh, exceed our target for MWESB participation. Most COVID-certified firms were just hovering around 31.6 uh, or 32 percent. Um, and, you know, as soon as uh, we get off uh, this meeting today, I will be continuing to work on all of the details that we need to get done between now and June 22nd so we can get this closed and under construction. Um, and I'm really happy to be here again and answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jill. And does that complete the presentation? I believe it does. Very good. Oh, Do we have sorry. people? Um, yeah, not my item. Oh. Yeah, Molly, is that the presentation? That, that concludes our presentation. We'd love to answer your questions. Excellent. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions? Do we have public testimony? No one signed up. All right. Very good. Thank you for the presentation. Great work. Please call the roll. Ryan. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Commissioner Rubio, Director Rogers, and Jill Chen. It was great to hear from the partners as well. Uh, it was about a year ago when Catholic Charities of Oregon was awarded this, the funds from the Housing Bureau to construct Francis Plus Claire Place in the Buckman neighborhood, and I'm just really thrilled to see how this is being executed and the financial commitments to move this forward. I also want to acknowledge my site visit to Catholic Charities last summer, I believe it was, and you just really have a culture that's uh, so um, perfect uh, to be a partner uh, for uh, low-income housing with services. So this is a really good, feel-good project. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Let's build some housing. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Um, I'm just really excited for this project. I want to thank um, Interim Director Rogers and, and the team at PHB, uh, Jill Chen, for all your excellent work here, and the teams at Catholic Charities and Eadlin for your great work on this as well. Um, this is uh, going to a very important thing and a very important time, and very happy to vote aye. Wheeler. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, as well as all the great people from the Portland Housing Bureau for their work on this project and bringing this item forward to us today. As we all know, we're in critical need of housing at all income levels across the city, including the deeply affordable level of zero to 30% of median income. All 61 units of this project will be permanent supportive housing targeting those who are experiencing or who are at very high risk for homelessness. Importantly, residents in this housing will be supported through services that focus specifically on housing stability, something that's desperately needed in our community. These important services, such as case management, peer support, referrals, and access to health care, will ensure the success of Portlanders in this housing. Building more on-ramps to permanent housing is critically important as a component of our overall city strategy to address homelessness. So thank you all for your great leadership on this. I vote aye, and the emergency ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Last but not least, colleagues, and I know it's been a long morning slash afternoon, we have item 393-1, a four-fifths agenda. 
decentralize the city's planning of the 2023 Rose Festival for improved and efficient coordination in public safety. Commissioner Gonzalez. Well, I'm very proud to present this. This addresses the city and Rose Festival shared goals of public safety and event success. I wanna take this opportunity to thank all the bureaus and partners who have come together to make this happen and to ensure this event is delivered. Uh, in the safest manner possible. In particular, PBOT, PPV, Prosper Portland, and of course, the Rose Festival, and Portland Fire. I would also like to thank my bureaus, including PBAM and Fire, for working together for the best outcome here. Commissioner Mapps, thank you for your leadership as the Rose Festival liaison and the help your office has given. That's it. Great, and, and colleagues, I misspoke. I didn't turn the page. We have another item after this. Uh, any. Yeah, sorry. That, that was actually almost cruel at this point, was it? Plus, what people can't see on TV is it's like 90 degrees in here, which is also kind of not great. At uh, any rate, uh, do we have any public testimony on this item? I signed up. Any further discussion on this item? Thanks, Commissioner. Call the roll. Ryan. Yes, um, I'm really happy to see this ordinance. I lived this experience last year. It was quite a fascinating journey. And so I'm really happy to hear that we're formalizing it and really pressing a restart for the necessary coordination um, activation without a really smart, smooth uh, plan for community safety would not be a good idea. And so I wanna acknowledge the good people at Rose Festival, CEO Marilyn Clint and your Clinton, your um, staff. It's uh, really exciting that Rose Festival's coming up, but it's so important that we don't have any last minute, are you kidding me moments um, that we were kind of experiencing last year. So I'm really delighted to see this in motion. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. I want to thank um, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, um, in particular Grace, for her work with our office and for working with Prosper Portland to make sure that um, we have all the right people at the table and happy to support this. I vote aye. Wheeler. Awesome work. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next and truly the last item is also a four-fifths agenda item. Item 393-2, ratified letter of agreement with the Portland Firefighters Association, International Association of Firefighters, Local 43, to settle an unfair labor practice complaint. Colleagues, this should be a relatively quick item. This is a resolution of an old unfair labor practice complaint. It involves a team at the Fire Bureau that was eliminated during budget cuts as Multnomah County provides a related service. With this ordinance, the ULP will be resolved. I'll now turn it over to Kim Fouts from Labor Relations. Hi, Kim. Hi, I hope you all can hear me. I'm having some troubles with my camera. No, you sound, you sound great. We can hear you. Perfect, great. Thank you so much, Mayor and Commissioners. It's really great to see you this afternoon and present this letter of agreement for your consideration and approval. The Portland Fire and Rescue had a dive team that received a premium pay for members of that team. The team, dive team was disbanded through the budget process for the fiscal year 2017 and 2018 and currently remains disbanded. The PFFA filed a ULP in 2017 for failing to bargain the impacts of that decision. The matter was not heard by the Employment Relations Board until October of 2021. The ERB at that time agreed with PFFA that the city should have bargained the impacts of cutting the dive team and ordered the city and PFFA to bargain those impacts of the decision to eliminate the team. The parties met and agreed to limit the economic liability to a 12 month period reflecting the premium and the overtime opportunities lost. The parties agreed to a finite amount of $91,431.08 representing the lost overtime opportunities for the firefighters on the dive team at the time of its elimination. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Any questions on this colleagues? Any public uh, testimony? No one signed up. Can't believe I forgot that word. <laughs> Very good. Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Thank you all for resolving this. This, this has been a long time coming, and I'm glad to see it amicably resolved and no longer before us. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted, and we are adjourned until 2 p.m.